welcome back to the Nethercast. It's episode eight. How was your guys' weekend? I hope it was good. I'm Black Cyborg. I have with me, as always, Shadowloo, temporary username, and Razor's Edge. How'd, how'd, how'd your guys' weekend go? Fantastic. Can't complain much. Buried in snow. Buried in snow? That's good. I mean, Buried you are in snow. Canada, so it's, yes. it's to be expected. We have a lot of that up here. Yeah, we we usually get snow around this time, too, but it hasn't happened. It's kind of unfortunate. We had a little bit, like, I think a month ago, but it's ceased... And we haven't gotten it since, so it kind of sucks. I hope it does before. Yeah, it's like 70 degrees over here, so it, it still kind of feels not very winter ish to me, but I don't know. We'll see what happens in February. I have relatives in Florida. Like two years ago, I spent Christmas there. Weirdest Christmas ever. Just doesn't feel right. <laughs> no, it really doesn't. Not going to lie. I would kind of like some more cold weather down here, but. But, All of my exposure to Florida is the Florida <laughs> You gotta finish that thought? <laughs> but... Well, the thing is, no. Oh. <laughs> well then, in that case, might as well just get down to it then. Um. So last night I went to the uh, Mythbusters thing. That was pretty fun. You guys watch Mythbusters at all? I, I watch it a lot, actually. I, yeah, I make it a point guys. to never watch TV. I don't do it unless it's like unless it's like Walking Dead or something that like my girlfriend and I are both following. No, I can't. I can't sit there and channel surf. I'm past that. That is so you. It really. You is. You just I don't seem it. like you have the attention span for that. No, I just hate it. I hate everything. I gotta watch TV. Gotta watch TV right now. Gotta watch TV. Gotta watch TV. I, I, I've gotta I hate do TV. this. No, man, <laughs> Where's the coffee? Where's the coffee? <laughs> That's incidental, probably related, but still incidental. You yeah. want you want to run around the world? Let's run around the world. All right. <laughs> See. Ya. <laughs> Wanna go shave a dog? <laughs> <laughs> you want the cheese? Microphone not working. Here, I'll just come over to your place. It's only what? <laughs> Freaking 20,000 miles. Chat has ADD. Chat has ADD. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, well, uh, this week's episode is going to be our top 10 of our favorite arenas in Mortal Kombat history throughout the series. Uh, we'll only be doing the. 10 through 6 for today, and you'll have to get the uh, 5 through 1 next week, just so we don't go on a super long episode. But uh, we're also going to kind of cover some of the news and stuff that's been talked about and revealed at the PlayStation Experience about MKX. So uh, yeah, we'll kind of touch upon that and give our opinions on that stuff. And then we have our character retrospective, as always. This week is Fujin, as picked by the members on MKO. Speaking of MKO... If, you, uh, if you're if you on YouTube, you can subscribe to our account or their account. We love it when you subscribe to our account, especially. We're up to uh, 90 subscribers, I think. It's actually pretty pretty awesome, so thank you guys. And we've gotten more good feedback from new listeners. Everyone seems to be very positive. Patrick McCarran from TRMK is actually liking, uh, liking the whole concept of this, and he hopes to uh, kind of spread the word as well, so that's pretty cool. And uh, so shout out to him. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for this. And we're also on iTunes if you're on the go, so definitely uh, subscribe to us on there as well. We love, we love it wherever you subscribe. Totally cool. Thanks for the feedback, and let's jump into this. Number 10 is Shang Tsung's Throne Room, which was, I believe, my number 3, if I'm not mistaken. And the reason why I particularly love this map so much is... In MK1, I just thought, when I think of MK1, I either think of the pit or I think of Shang Tsung's throne room. Just because it just has that classic color scheme of that that kind of muted blue almost. It's, it's like an electric but muted blue, as well as reds and golds. It just looks very royal, very regal. And it just, you have Shang Tsung in the background and he claps and laughs along as you fight. And I just thought, I don't know, it's just so iconic, so classic to me that I... When I think MK1, definitely I think of Shang Tsung's throne room. And I really like the MK9 uh, remake of it, or whatever you want to call it. And I love the the lightning and the storm going on, how you can battle out onto the deck or whatever that is. I just thought it was really, really well done as you're fighting along. So yeah, I, I'm just a big fan of this map. Looks, feel, it just looks really, really clean and nice. It just looks good. I, I'm really digging it. 
a common theme, actually, which is kind of funny, on my personal top 10 list, not our combined top 10 list, is a lot of mine had to do with somebody sitting there watching you as you're fighting. <laughs> Weirdly enough, like, I think five or six of the maps were maps that somebody's watching you, be it Khan's Arena, Shang Tsung's Throne Room, Goro's Lair and MK9. Just There's always somebody just watching you fight, which is just kind of an odd thing that I noticed throughout the uh, throughout some of my picks. Oh, the courtyard, another one. But uh, all right, any anybody else have any thoughts on Shang Tsung Throne Room? I know it didn't make anybody else's personal list, but what do you any anything you guys want to add on to that? Personal didn't make... Oh well, yeah, go I on. guess we all do. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone <laughs> at once and go. <laughs> I'll simply say to start off that I find it highly amusing, interesting, and somewhat revealing, and a little bit titillating that you like to be watched. But that aside. Well, you do have my Skype. You want to work something out? <laughs> you guys do this in private, maybe? <laughs> You're right. Now's not the time. I will. Yeah. <laughs> <Wait>. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So, um, in terms of uh, old Shang's throne room, I definitely am a big fan of it. It's one of the classic MK stages. I associate it just as much with the hilarious old school animation of Clang... Uh, Shang clapping. <laughs> Clang Sung. That's his new name. Clang. <laughs> He's also related to Krang from the Ninja Turtles. <laughs> Did you mention Shang had that voice? <laughs> ah, little Kang. You defeated Prince Goro. Ah, I challenge you anyway. I'm a very poor loser. See, I went the other direction. I thought, what if Crane had that mustache? And I was like, wow, <laughs> oh, that's so much better. <laughs> <laughs> I could see it. Just this weird little blob with a mustache and a robe. <laughs> Big clapping white with his little brain shoe hanging down. Yeah, yeah that's it. It's the, it's, it's, it's the clapping animation that I, that I really associate uh, that arena with. That, that that's what stands out to me all the time. It's just, as time goes on, it's become more stiff looking and really hilarious. But, but no, I, I do love the arena for its own merits. It does kind of bother me when they redesigned it in, uh, in uh, MK9 that the, the dragon uh, emblems on the window is behind, like, next to Shang. They're both facing the same way in 2011, and the original one, yeah, they were, they were both facing towards him. So they, they lost a bit of symmetry, which kind of threw me off, but I'm not, it's, it's not going to be the end of the world for me. I, I, I still love it. It's, it's a great arena. The lighting and the storms are also two things I really, really do appreciate. That said, I don't need to see it come back for MK10. I'm going to be saying that for most, most of the classic stages, because I feel that MK9 did a really good job of doing service to a lot of the old school arenas, both day and night settings, and maybe if it was just really given a complete overhaul, like we saw of Shang's Island destroyed or in ruins, and, you know, get a bunch of Oni among, crawling among there, and having it be full of actual rainwater, that'd be nice, but I could go without it. Still, always a long-time favorite of mine. Just don't need to see it back right now. All right, Temp, you had something to say? I did, um... I think it stands out out of the MK1 stages a lot because I didn't vote for it, but I was secretly hoping it would make the list. Um, a lot of the MK1 stages are very bland when it comes to color, and then you get to the throne room, and it's like so much red. And I think the red and gold looks really well together. It was also one of the best updated stages. I think they really did something cool with the throne room around the time MK9 came out, like Shadaloo said. And, I mean, if, if you look at it, of course, when you get to the corners, it's raining outside, and, I mean, you can interpret that as it's almost like a ceremonial atmosphere, but you could kind of read into that in a more superficial way, as in, they were going to have the matches outside, but they got rained out, and that kind of makes me laugh a little, I don't know why, that even <laughs> this Grand Mortal Kombat tournament, they could still get rained out, like, alright guys, inside, can't do this, no, storm. But I don't know, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of it, though. Um, I, I just think it really... When it stands next to a lot of the MK1 stages, it looks really good. And I think Shang... I don't, I don't know. I, I can't think... Except for the courtyard, I'm not really looking for background elements when it comes to the MK1 stages. So that one really sticks out for that reason as well. I mean, I guess there's Goro's eye... Or the eyes in Goro's lair. There's, like, uh, the courtyard clapping. But I don't know. I, I think it really lends status to your villain when you have him in the background prior to the final battle. I, I think that worked really well. Yeah. Razor, anything? Yeah, um... 
Well, I didn't vote for the throne room because, I guess, uh, thinking back to the original MK1, my favorite stages were probably the courtyard and the warrior shrine. But I do, I do like the throne room. At least I like the um, the revamp version that we saw in MK9. And before that, it wasn't exactly the same, but they did a revamp for the uh, the opening cinema of Shaolin monks that made it look really cool too. Yeah, for sure. I always thought that the um, the original from MK1 looked a little too uh, flat and maybe too colorful, too much red, like. There's something about it that looks a little fake, like a movie set rather than a real, like, room, I guess. But, I mean, obviously, the the MK9 improvements uh, really, really added a lot there. I love the rain and the lightning in the background. and Like, the both the courtyard and Shang's throne room really... Um, perfectly sort of uh, sum up visually the idea of martial arts tournament. Like, when I think of, you know, uh, like a kung fu tournament, like you'd see in a movie, like it's, you know, a deathmatch tournament being held in private, these are sort of the kinds of locations I imagine in my head. And So, like, if you want to talk MK1, what really, like, embodies that game, it's either the throne room or the car- courtyard to me. So, yeah. yeah, like, I love the idea of those stages, and, um, but as far as, like, seeing the throne room come back, uh, I mean, I don't think that, like, the thing with, um, stages, for me, is that they kind of gotta fit the plot, and I can't really imagine a reason for them to go back to Shang's palace on the island in MKX, so, I mean, that's pretty much how I feel about that. Yeah. All right, let's uh, move on to the uh, number nine stage, and that is the Deadpool, which was also another pick of mine, was my second place. So did, I don't think anybody else voted for this map, which I actually was quite surprised, because I when I think MK2, I just, I love the Deadpool. I love the color scheme. The, the, the thought of fighting on a little thin, like, walkway or bridge, whatever you want to call it, uh, with acid right there, just a little pool of acid. I just thought it was really, I don't know, iconic. Once again, just another iconic map that when I think of that game, that is the the stage that I automatically think of right away. And the, the hooks hanging down, the chains, the little, like, almost the Buddha-like statues, not really Buddha, but whatever you want to call those, uh, along the wall and the ends, and then the, the grating with the, like, all the dried up water, the acid or whatever it is that came down through those grates and just in general like the little kind of shine and reflection in the in the acid and obviously being able to knock your opponent into the acid i just thought it was a really which was you know there wasn't very there's a few uh stage fatalities in mk2 and only one in mk1 so it's one that definitely stood out because of that and i just thought the environment itself was just a really, really iconic place to fight. To fight that I think goes right up there, along with like the pit or something like that. Fighting alongside a pool of acids, just quite awesome. How about uh, how about you, Razor? Did you have anything to say about this particular map? Uh, yeah. The thing about like for me, you you can say that it it is one of the most iconic, and I don't disagree, especially because you know it's one of the three in MK2 that had a stage fatality. The thing for me is every single stage in MK2 are basically, like, the most iconic ones in the series to me. Like, I don't know if I could pick a favorite out of that game. Yeah. I might be able to pick a least favorite. I've never liked the Armory. (laughs) But, um... Yeah, I mean, the Deadpool... See, the thing is, it's like they say in The Incredibles, when everything's special, when everyone's special, no one is. And that's kind of how I feel about the MK2 stages. Like, I can't really say anything one way or the other about the Deadpool because it's like I'm comparing it to the portal in the combat tomb and the wasteland and Khan's arena. There's just so damn many that I like. Yeah. It's kind of, it's like a 10 way tie, but right. I mean, I do like it. Um, no, sure you do. We believe you. <laughs> I just, um, 
if I had any, like, complaint at all, I think maybe the MK9 version was actually one of the few that was a little too detailed and too busy. I mean, it still looks good, I just, I don't know if I like it as much as I liked the original with the, the more plain walls and the smaller grates. Yeah. I, I want to know what the hell those, like, hooded guys with the glowing thing in their chest are. Those, like, the axe dudes in the background that, like, Jax fights one American gladiator style in story mode. <laughs> yeah. What the hell are those guys? <laughs> they don't look like hard cottons or anything. I mean, it's one of the great mysteries. <laughs> yeah. Outworld grunts just kind of working for con, I guess. Rolling prisoners into the pits, earning their nine to five. All right, Sam. Yeah, I like I like that scene where they're playing dice while they're like off duty or just waiting for something to happen. <laughs> Which they don't have eyes, so how do they know they're winning? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's called Sam and Ralph. They get in for their 9 to 5, and they just have a friendly rivalry all day. Get dunked in acid. They're alive by the end of the day. It's a good laugh. They all go home. Alright, uh, did you two, did you two little rapscallions with the same voice have anything to say on this one? <laughs> How about you, Temp? Um, not a lot to say, to be honest with you. I okay, like how about you, Shadowloo? <laughs> Alrighty then, well, no, no, go on. Um, it's... Yeah, the Deadpool's cool. I mean, like Razor said, you know, I love so many stages from MK2. That as cool as it is, it just kind of, it has trouble competing because I like the idea more than I like the actual visual. Uh, there, there's not really a lot going on in the classic MK2 stage. And in, in, when MK9 comes around, it's, I don't know how to describe it. it something just, I don't, I don't feel, like, feel like it gels in the same way. I, I think it came back in Deception. And I remember liking it a little more back in Deception. I think because oh, I had not seen it in so long. <laughs> I was like, oh my god, I know what this is. I'm going to play here, you know? And I did not like the remakes in Deception just because everything either had to be a circle or a square. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> like a square Like the pit makes and the Deadpool. Oh, okay. I, mean, I kind of the... liked how they had MK2 Shang up on a balcony. Like, for some reason, he came back from the dead and put on an old pair of clothes just to watch you fight. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, man, don't just those clothes. Those are my favorite look for Shay. Yeah, but right. um, I don't know. Like, I feel like a platform actually does make sense for the Deadpool. I don't think a platform makes any sense for the pit. Um, and yeah, I, it's cool. And yeah. <laughs> Shadow All right. <laughs> All right. Um, again, much the, same, much the same way that Razor uh, said for uh, the throne room. A lot of the backgrounds in MK1 and 2 are kind of tied to the story for me, and I frankly just don't see a lot of reason to go back there. Not right now, anyway. Not for any particular reason I can think of. It's a great stage. I've always liked it. never had any problems with it. It's not one of my favorites, but I'm never disappointed when it comes back. I didn't have any particular qualms with the Deception version. I'll give it this. Um, in terms of what they're going for now with stage interactables, it would be really... I mean, the fact that there were just all these chains hanging from the ceiling, it... It'd be a natural fit to have someone, you know, kind of grab along one of those and hoist themselves to the end for, for a really long jump. And yeah, that could work. I wouldn't mind seeing that, but I just, I have no desire to see it come back at this particular time. It's actually kind of funny that Shaolin Monks has also been the only game so far we've been able to uppercut someone onto those descending hooks. Wouldn't mind that coming back uh, add a little bit of extra spice to the stage fatality if ever it did return. Yeah. But that's all I've really got to say about it. It's it's a great stage, but we just had a decent version in MK9, and I'm one for variation, and I'd much rather see a lot of MK4 stages given priority, or see new places in the Netherrealm with a focus on Shinnok, yeah, that's the atmosphere that we're going, that we're going to be going for for uh, a lot of MK10, and yeah, I can think of more places I'd want to be. Not a bad stage, a fun stage, a classic stage, but just doesn't need to be there every time. That's it. All right. Well, that takes us to our uh, number eight stage, and that's the Pantheon of Elder Gods, which I think uh, Razor definitely had on his list. So yep, why don't yep. you start us off on this one? Okay, well, the, uh, the Pantheon of Elder Gods stage, if you don't know which one we're talking about, is the one from MK4 with the blue faces on the walls. Yeah. Which um, I think it originally looked kind of goofy in MK4, but... 
in the scene in MK9 story mode where Raiden and Liu Kang go to talk to the Elder Gods, I think this stage was where they were supposed to be, like a complete revamp. Like, the, f the pattern on the floor seems similar, and the Elder Gods do appear as, like, big, glowing blue figures. Uh -huh. But it's, like, open air. It's sort of like a like an open Roman, like, pantheon sort of thing with columns, and the the background is, like, this cosmic space area with weird colored clouds and, like, multiple planets. And it just looked really awesome, and, you know, the moment I saw it, I was like, oh, I wish we could fight there. And especially, whatever MK4 elements we may be seeing in MKX definitely makes me, like, want to see an MK4 stage like this return. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's definitely, uh, when I've, I've mentioned, like, the iconic stages of each game and what I associate with each game, when I do, when I think of MK4, I, this stage is one of, like, one or two that immediately come to mind. I always thought, like you said, it was kind of goofy as well, that their faces are just kind of groaning and moaning, and they just do that little, that weird... Like I said, they're, they're almost like yelling or something. It's just, it's like an angry face and it's so weird, but just the whole atmosphere itself is kind of neat. Just like lit torches around and all these, you know, elder god faces just kind of watching you. It should have made my list just for that. But <laughs> It always struck me as kind of silly that the elder gods finally appear in the series and they're just a wall with a face on it. Yeah. Like, you can walk up and punch that face and they can't do anything. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it was, I mean, it's just such a weird looking thing, but yeah, it's definitely something that sticks out and stands out. So I, I give it credit for that, and if it were to be brought back, it, it would definitely be interesting to see it in MKX, like an actual stage you can fight in like that, like a remade stage like that. What What's your uh, temp, what's your uh, opinions on this, if any? This stage was actually pretty high on my list. Uh, I wasn't sure if anyone else was going to vote for it, so I wanted to make sure I had it pretty high up there. Which what was really it for like you? It. Do you remember? I want to say it was like number four. Okay, I knew somebody else voted for it, but I, I couldn't remember. Yeah, and I, I really like it. Um, I <laughs> to this day it still doesn't come off as uh, silly to me. I I look at it and. With the faces on the wall, something about that is very surreal to me. I look at it, and it's like a William Blake painting kind of coming to life, you know? And the cool thing about that is the Elder Gods were always kind of like that to me. They they weren't really something that could be embodied naturally. I mean, I mean obviously later on, you know, th that comes... There's clarity to that. But at that point, we don't really know much about them. So it kind of makes sense they would look very surreal and weird like you know i mean just take the phrase faces on the wall and that's what comes to mind it's something almost creepy almost something abnormal well, i guess it is abnormal but i like the idea a lot as well i think just on paper i think it's very fascinating uh when it comes to mk4 in general not a lot of the stages were very memorable to me i remember liking them i remember thinking oh that stage is really cool but if you ask me to like kind of describe them i'm at a loss until we get to the Elder Gods Arena, that that is kind of burned into my mind in a good way. So, yeah, I think fondly of it. I don't really mind the fact that, I mean, in, in my mind, the the Pantheon in MK9 and the Elder Gods Arena in MK4, I, I kind of categorize them differently. I realize they're probably going for the same thing, but the fact that it is very concealed in MK4 kind of, to me, that was, they did that because of Shinnok. They did that because Shinnok was on the run destroying shit. I mean that that's that was a rationalization in my mind. So they're kind of more discreet. They're they're covert, you know. Um, now, and I don't think the elder gods specifically have anything to worry about. I was thinking it was more like the realm gods who are in danger of Shinnok. But you know, if 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 you're going into council with the elder gods, I mean, yeah, Shinnok's a threat. You have to worry about that. I don't know. Thoughts on that? Does that make sense? Do you think Shinnok had anything to do with that, or was it just a weird aesthetic design choice and they wanted an indoor stage in MK4? Uh. Personally, I always kind of assumed that the this was like some room in like a tower and like you'd go there to pray if you were like Raiden or Fujin, somebody who the Elder Gods would answer to. You'd show up there and maybe like the faces weren't on the wall until you like asked for them or prayed to them and then they'd appear and they give 
you advice or whatever. And, you know, it just happened to be like a room in some ancient, like, church or tower in MK4, whereas in MK9, it's like a location in heaven that Raiden had to teleport to. That makes sense. And, I mean, that's not inconsistent either. I mean, that it may if, if something like that came back, you could have both arenas. You could have the Pantheon from MK9. You could have that. I mean, I mean, that does beg the question, if Raiden's able to go to the Pantheon, why not just do that every time? But, I mean, if it's for, like, a for ritual, I could see something like that being the case. Uh, another thought I just had was, maybe the version we see in MK9 is also the Nexus from Deception. Because it's, you know, it's a very similar shape. It doesn't have the portals or the stand for the Kamidogus, but it's still, like, this uh, platform just out in, like, some weird cosmic space area with columns. I could get so behind that. It Maybe be it's kind of a combination they, uh, of the two. It wouldn't be the first time that they've retconned a few stages to be one and the same. But I can actually get behind that, because I have no particular strong attachment to the Serena or the Nexus. If they made both, if, if, if they did put both of them together, I, I think I'd be overjoyed, as a matter of fact. It'd uh, make a hell of a lot of sense. Because where better to store the Kami Dogu than in the presence of the Elder Gods themselves, who probably want these things looked after? I think the I think the Elder Gods arena was a pretty good choice for this list. It wasn't on mine, but I wouldn't mind it coming back. But yes, it, it, it definitely needs a lot lot in the way of a makeover. Strangely, strangely enough, I think that the faces are kind of what make the arena as memorable as it is, as much as it is. If we are to bring this back as like the kind of celestial place seen in MK9. I think that the faces should definitely still be around. Obviously, if it not, it not being a 3D arena, you couldn't like have them, you know, being all around you, but kind of like maybe in a row at the back, I suppose, kind of like, you know, how the Warrior Shrine had a bunch of statues next to each other. I could see them there as like a kind of pillars of light with faces in them or heat or water or whatever you want. And if you really wanted to, you could actually... I could actually picture the Elder Gods serving as a kind of a stage fatality. Nothing so pedestrian, again, as throwing one throwing someone into someone's mouth. But, like, I mean, when you consider the fact that these are supposed to be the most powerful, like, creatures in the universe pretty well, just the idea of, like, maybe knocking someone into, into one of them, like a giant the Elder God pillar of light at either side of the stage, and just having them be vaporized instantly, that is something that I would like, really like to see. Yeah. All right, well, let's uh, move on to our number seven, and that was the tower. This is a this is a pretty iconic stage as well. Once again, I mean, even the window wasn't that in the first MK movie, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. When it, when Lou fights Reptile, there's like right, there's like a grate over it, and it's like dark, but it's the same shape, sort of. Yeah. Yeah. That. Yeah, so that that in, that in its own right definitely stands out to me. That window where you can see out to the clouds, and obviously a druid is just watching you. When there's a common theme of somebody just watching you as you find. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, and the carpet and everything. I I really I really like this arena. It's just it's simple but elegant in that own way. And you're up in the air. MK9 had a version of this, of course, and I thought that looked pretty good too. But was it called the Tower in MK9? It was called the Evil Monastery. Right, right. I knew it was... I, I, I didn't think it was called the Tower, but yeah, I knew it was at least inspired by that. It's the same kind of concept. But uh, but yeah, in MK2, the, I, I, I did like the Tower. I didn't vote for it personally, but it was on kind of the, the cutting block of... There was like two or three that I was trying to figure out what would be my number 9 and 10... And I knew they were going to be from MK2 just because I like so many of the stages, as was discussed before. And uh, it's like choosing between your children. But ultimately, the tower didn't make my list. But yeah, I, I really do like this stage. And uh, yeah, it's just it's just a nice looking stage with that iconic window. It's the thing that always sticks out to me. And the druid, of course. But the druid was featured in a couple other arenas as well in MK2. One that I'm sure we'll get to eventually. But uh, I'll let you speculate on that. <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> but, uh, Shadowloo, what are your thoughts on the tower? Meh. 
All right. I'm um... just. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. No. Really? Again, no. It's 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 a good stage, but I feel like I've seen it enough times. I'm. I don't need it to come back for at least three games, and I've just never been a huge fan of it. The window design is iconic, and that image of the monk sort of floating in the background there. It's it's it's, it's a great image too, but I liked it better when it was like kind of floating in front of an ominous portal, which we'll eventually get to. But it doesn't jump out at me. It, w- it wouldn't. It wouldn't make my. It wouldn't make my top ten list. I didn't vote for it. I only vote for make my top twenty list. There's just not a lot going on in that stage for me. I've always appreciated, I suppose, the fact that you know you're apparently really high up with the clouds going by at such a quick pace. But <laughs> it's just, it's just kind of there for me. It's All not right, a stage that's ever really grabbed my attention. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. All right, enough well, of no, you. It's, it's fine. It's fine. Well. The tower is actually my favorite stage in MK history, so it's. Um, I mean, I see where you're coming from. Don't get me wrong. I, I mean, I, I guess like like Cyborg said earlier, everyone's kind of everyone has their thing. You know, Cyborg likes that voyeur element with his stages, and for me, mm-hmm. I like places that are really high up in the air. That I don't know why, but that that's my that's my thing. And when I first played MK two, and you see, you know, the window itself. It gives the impression that you're almost in like the stratosphere. It's ridiculously high up, and something about that was very majestic to me. I always really liked that. I, I, I like you know the overall colors. Um, you know, it's like they took parts of Shang Tsung's throne room from the first game, and you know they, they kind of made it more subtle. You know, you have, you have the red carpet. You know, you have like the, the decorative aspects on, on the sides. You know, and you have the two shadow priests. Um, everything came together so well. Um, I love that music. That music is forever in my head. I'm, and that, um, I'm glad it is. I hope it never goes away. Uh, very big fan. And it's a theme that kind of runs through all my favorite stages. And when it came back in Deception, it looked amazing. Not Deception. Armageddon. It looked fantastic. It was by far the best looking stage in Armageddon. Um, and it even had some interactions. You can knock people down, like the staircase they added. Yeah. And then the stage fatality was when the sort of like the open wall you would fall off into the into the into the never. I, I loved it. And just God, just all those colors worked so well for me. The light blue and the crimson red, and just very atmospheric. I love. But I, I do see why you don't like it, Chad, because. It, it, you have to almost have those fetishes as well. You have to really be into those elements, and I am all about those elements. I love that. I love that stuff so much. I've mentioned in the past that I really enjoy it when Outworld is portrayed as dark and twisted as is humanly possible. You know, almost the level of unbelievability. And I will say this for it: it was one of my favorite places to visit in Shaolin Monks, with all the spikes sitting around and like the places that looked like there were sacrificial altars and meditating, like, demonic figures. It was great then. Don't get me wrong. I wouldn't want it to never, ever come back. I'm just I'm just saying. It came back in Armageddon. We had a really nice version of it in 9, and I don't need it to come back right away. Well, actually, I'm glad you said that, because in Shaolin Monks, what was special about the tower is that it was still a fucking tower. They turned it into a monastery for some reason in MK9, and that... Well, okay, I, well, Actually, I think they started calling it the Evil Monastery in Shaolin Monks. And I think I don't just, know. it is still a giant tower. I think they call it the Monastery because it's supposed to be where the Shadow Priests, like, live. But I feel that's like so much is lost when you, when you have stuff in the background of that window, you no longer feel like you're miles up in the air. And again, that's, that's my thing. That's what I was that's going through. That's true. I didn't, I didn't really like that there were, like, other mountains and castles in the distance in the MK9 version. Yeah, because now it's just a normal ass tower. There's nothing special about it. You know, the most special thing about that tower is the carpeting, and that that's well, okay. Uh, it's good. I mean, it's evil. They did add the fact it's... that instead of the clouds going fast, it turns from night to day really fast. Like time is sped up there, that's which true. is really weird. Like I'm not sure how that's supposed to work logistically. Like if you go to have a fight in the tower, and the sun passes the sky like five times, and then you go back to Khan's arena, is it five days later where he's at? <laughs> I don't no, think I, that I was it actually say, works yeah. like that, you know? I'm all for elements of Lovecraftian things that don't make any sense and non-Euclidean geometry and time passing strangely. 
Jeff Rovin's old MK novel actually had like this section where they were describing like parts of uh, Outworld and Shanks Fortress where Sonya was just kind of walking down a hallway and she's like, she's noting to herself that like parts of the hallway that looked like they turned right and, 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 and from far away distances actually turned left. Angles that looked like they went up actually went down. And it's kind of a shame that we really can't get that kind of an effect. We haven't seen that kind of effect yet in MK stages. I'd love to see that. Yeah, I mean, if, if time is wonky in, like, the realms or, like, in Outworld or Shang's Island, that's that's cool. I'm, I'm all for that. I just, you know, want them to acknowledge it, like, and say, where have you been all week? I had one fight over there in that weird tower. <laughs> yeah, it turns out Shang Tsung's only, like, 15 years old, but time just moves incredibly <laughs> fast there. Yeah, I, I, I interpret it as, like, maybe there's, like, a thundercloud that's just, like, opening up and closing because of the weird-ass outworld conditions. I thought maybe that was what was going on, but... I feel like, the I mean, the sun sort of changes direction in the sky, like, it moves from east to west, and there might be a moon out there, too, at some point. I don't remember that well. <laughs> well, I mean, it's I guess I'm not against it on principle. If the tower is the hyperbolic time chamber, or spirit of time room, <laughs> then I guess that's okay. I'm not against that, but... Why? I mean, they don't communicate any reason for that to happen. Yeah, yeah, see, that's that's what I'm saying. Like, I wish there was some lore behind that whole day-to-night effect it has now. <laughs> what happens if you, like, Johnny phones Sonya while she's up there? Is there, like, some sort of time dilation effect going on? Sonya, yeah, like, babe, you okay? Uh, Alvin and the Chipmunks <laughs> voice over the radio? I think you're coming through <laughs> What's that? Speak up! I can't hear you! <laughs> Here comes a Red Dwarf episode. Uh, we now yeah, know the I tower mean, is... Uh, yeah, go on. Are, are you done? I was gonna say my piece about the tower. But oh, I'm never say done. That. I just want to say that it bothers me that they have to specifically call it the evil tower. Or the evil monster. No just, shit! Just in case you didn't really? know what alignment the Shadow Priests are. The guys who worship Shao Kahn. Let's be very clear. Come should on. have done it with all stages. It should have been the inconsiderate acid pool, you know? Just <laughs> now, is it the lawful evil tower or the chaotic evil tower? <laughs> Noob's bad, terrible, awful, not very good dwarfin. <laughs> this is the mean-spirited forest. Not to be confused with any other uh, sincere forest out there. And over here is the, uh, the cheerful portal. I'd like to take that to uh, Happy Realm. <laughs> This is the pit like... with no spikes in it. <laughs> Get very specific. Right across from the forlorn armory. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> the happy portal is shaped like the awesome emoticon. <laughs> All right. Yeah, the tower. <laughs> um, I I actually like the tower a lot. Uh, which is kind of a contradiction for me, because if you remember last week, I was complaining about stages located in Outworld that have a blue sky. <laughs> but, see, that was sort of my favorite thing about the tower, is that it was the only one in MK2 that had a blue sky, which created a mystery. You know, it's like, why does this place look so sunny with the fluffy clouds and everything, and everywhere else in Outworld is, you know, red and purple skies and hellish wasteland? And I like that Shell and Monks kind of explained it. Like, if you look at it, as you climb the tower, the sky turns from red and black to blue. Like, uh, the, the weird colored sky is some sort of pollution that hangs over all of the corrupted and, you know, just suck dry of life places in Outworld, thanks to Shao Kahn. And the tower is so tall, it's actually above the pollution, and you can actually see normal sky. And I like that about it, and I don't know if that's kind of gone now that it's a weird, you know, the hyperbolic time chamber, but <laughs> that was one of my favorite things about it in Shaolin Monk, so. Uh, but it, it is, it just looks cool, and, you know, like like you said, that window's in the movie, it's, you know, even they recognize that it has an iconic look to it, and, I don't know, one of the things that bummed me out about MK9 is there were, like, the Shadow Priests didn't seem to be around so much anymore. I mean, they were in the stages, but you never actually see them show up in story mode. Yeah. I was just kind of bothered they had faces. I kind of liked it better when there yeah. was nothing there. It was just an empty yeah. hood. Yeah. 
and now they're all like they have the semblance of noobs I bought, and that kind of takes yeah. away from noob in my opinion, you know? Yeah, Much yeah. More anyway, you don't know what's there. Fear of the unknown, sublimity. Exactly, you project your own face, and usually it, in the context, it's going to be something cryptic and maybe just just horrible looking, you know. And that they took that out. What really bugged me is the one in the um, the MK9 church, the guy who's like raising meat from the dead. And then in story mode, that's a good guy hideout. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> they rent it out at night. <laughs> Excuse me, do you mind? Don't worry, I'll just perform my dark rituals in a corner. <laughs> yeah. They're reserved from I three always, to six. Yeah. I always just imagine the church was like where the ritual that brought Sindel back from the dead was held and making it, you know, Nightwolf's house or whatever was dumb as hell. Agreed. Completely agreed. Alright, well let's uh, move on to our number six, and this was actually my personal number one, and that is The Pit, which I just kind of lumped The Pit 1 and Pit 2 together, even though obviously they're very different, but the reason why I did that is because if they can do it in MK9, then I can do it for this <laughs> list. Nah. <laughs> my favorite is The Pit 3, fuck all y'all. <laughs> that was actually on my list, that was like number eight, I think. Uh, no, you uh, can't. I you briefly, can't. You can't. I briefly considered putting it on my list. No, number three, not one or two. Uh, I do miss it. What's with the hate on one and two? <laughs> well, There's I, no hate. Actually, it's just that those things don't exist the way that we remember them fondly anymore. I guess they've been amalgamated yeah. into a bastardization. See, I don't know. For me, well, there no, might be a little bit of hate. It's not even amalgamated. It's straight up the pit two. They're just calling it the pit and saying it's on Shang's Island, even though there's miles and miles of mountains in the background. But that it's ain't got no spikes. fucking island. It's got spikes. <laughs> 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 See, for me, the pit. If we're talking pit one, once again, iconic stages that go. You know, that kind of. When I think of a game, that's what I think of. Beyond Shang Tsung's throne room or maybe the courtyard, the pit is definitely within those two. It, they form like the top three of that game in terms of what I think of when I think of MK1. And then obviously that translates over to MK2 when they made the much better looking version because there's a lot more visual aesthetics to it, especially in the background with the bridge and the mountains, etc. Um, but then MK9 with the day and night versions, which I thought both of them looked really, really good. I loved... In the night version, you have that giant moon that, you know, calls back to the original first two. But then in the day version, you have things falling from the sky, which I thought was really cool from the volcano or whatever. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I just really like the visual aesthetics of this map or arena. I don't know. I keep calling it a map. Got first person shooters on the brain, apparently. But, uh, yeah, this arena, I just, I, it's such an iconic stage. It was in the, the, I'm not even going to say it's in the movie because <laughs> actually in the movie it sucked really bad because <laughs> didn't they have, I, was that what was supposed to be on the way to Goro was the pit? When when they were like exploring the cave. Yeah. And they're going I, through spider webs so. even though Katana just went through all there. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, cause that was, that kind of vaguely had a, not the pit one, but I mean it had they that. Kind of, they were on a bridge with a lot right. of other bridges around, but that—I right. mean, you could call it a pit. And Nobody then, actually fought there, so yeah. whatever. And then at the end of the movie, they had the spikes rise up, kind of to also play up that idea of the pit, even yeah. though obviously that wasn't it, the location. That was but, the ledge, <laughs> right? <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I just love the visuals of this map. Or damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I can say Ermac and say they and them consistently, but I can't not say map. <laughs> Great. But the, no, the stage, the arena, whatever. <laughs> Apparently when I disagree, I get into a Boston accent. <laughs> Fucking caps. But no. Uh, this arena, I really enjoy the aesthetics in every single iteration of it, even Pit 3, which... Once again, I don't see why you guys like that the most, because Pit 1 and 2 just look so damn awesome. Pit 1, for its completely clean aesthetic, even though so many people are supposedly die there, it looks pretty damn clean. But it's just up, you know, for liking big, tall things, giggity, uh, it's up there in the air, <laughs> and all you see, you know, is the moon in the background. Occasionally Santa or a witch goes by, which, you know, that that's what happens on Shang Tsung's Island. <laughs> Anything goes. <laughs> 
<laughs> but uh, in the pit too, it just looks so. I don't know. It just looks great. But I, I really like like night stages. I like the blue overtones. I'm a cool color type of guy, not a warm color. So the pit always kind of has that. And I thought the the remake of it, the the mashup in MK9, captured that really well. And uh, yeah, it just looked really good. And also, obviously, the stage fatality is absolutely iconic. But uh, that kind of speaks for itself. Yeah, I actually, I mean, I like the pit one. I think, I think the, well, I just like that sort of the architecture of it looks the same as other stages in MK1. So like, there's there's a sense of like these places are all connected to each other. They're not just you know random. Like, there were, like, archways and the way it, the stones were, like, stacked up and stuff like that. You could see elements of Goro's Lair or the Warrior Shrine or the Palace Gates sort of were common also in the pit. Yeah. And, I mean, the, the Spike Fatality is um, iconic. I think MK9 ruined the pit, too, for me, though. Like, I used to like it, and now I don't. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that a, they lied and said it's on Shang's Island so they could delete the pit one, which just makes me bitter. B, Blaze and Hornbuckle aren't back there anymore. It's, you know, either nobody or random characters from Armageddon. And C, they took away the most unique thing about it, which that, which is in MK2, when you fell, it changed the camera angle and you, you know, landed flat face up instead of on spikes. Those sons of bitches. <laughs> I know, I know. They're, I'm whining, but <laughs> but you're right. I mean, no, I, yeah, I, I you, I'm, I'm not. Really I'm not yeah. discrediting what you're saying. They're very valid points for not liking it for sure. Yeah, but I don't know. The thing I liked about the pit three was there was something about like the the color scheme and the mood, the fact that that's where the final battle with Shao Kahn was fought. That all sort of. I don't know, it just worked for me with, like, the, the brown stone walls with the faces carved in them and those little floating, like, cages with souls in them that lit the place. Like, I like the idea that uh, Khan lights his throne room with souls as light fixtures. He's like, I got a million of these, I'm just gonna stick them in, like, these things that float. And I don't need light bulbs or candles. <laughs> I always, I really appreciated the fact that the Pit 3 was... What, well, what I interpreted that was basically like, yeah, it's it's kind of his actual throne room. This is, I feel like this is the place where during the MK3 period that you would go when you wanted an audience with Khan. Because yeah, there's, this is, there is this a is, throne at the end of the bridge. There is. And this is what I felt like should actually be Khan's throne room, because if he doesn't like what you've got to say, down you go, you know? It's something that I, I feel like just really, really totally suits him, and it's a damn shame that the, that the Pit 3 never came back. Yeah. I I like, I, I, I admire the, the work that they created in bringing the Pit 1 and 2 together. I can understand, even from the doors their viewpoint, I guess, that the Pit 1 maybe wasn't as interesting anymore. You know, kind of old hats, they wanted to spruce it up and maybe combine it with the aesthetics of the Pit 2. I wish they hadn't, but I'm not going to argue with the results. It certainly looks nice, all of the considerations aside. I really do think, though, that the Pit 2 had the absolute best stage fatality in the entire series, though. That yeah, that top-down that, that top down look, and and especially, I'll give a shout-out to Dan Ford and the audio team here, and voice acting, for the best screams of any point in the series. When they fell, you felt the terror. You really did. That said, I don't need to see the Pit come back again. And I think it's time that they kind of manned up and made an official pit four. We haven't had a new place worthy of being called the pit since three. That's that's not acceptable to me. Call something the pit four. Make, I don't know, in hell, wherever you want, chaos realm, order realm, do something with it. It's 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 a it's a good solid concept and a cornerstone of the MK universe that just isn't evolving the way it should. I I imagine if they made a new pit, they'd call it the Pit X. <laughs> That's fine by me. Yeah, I really I don't, don't know why new, they haven't made a call, new one Call like it that. New Pit, for all I care. Just do something new. Be proud of that pit. 
They can call it Pit 4 or they can call it Pit X. I don't care either way as long as it's in outer space because that's really what's important to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, as long as it's really high up there. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, get it crazy. Well, here's the thing, all right? I wanted, uh, you know, a, a cosmic stage for a very long time, and obviously characters aren't going to fight in outer space, but if someone's having a vision, if there's an ethereal plane, there's no reason it couldn't have that aesthetic. And I figured... Why, you know, if we have the Pantheon, they're still fighting on a platform. But if you have a pit, well, that makes sense because you can see all the background now. There, there's nothing obscured. So how they do it, I don't care, but I've wanted that for a really long time. And, you know, there's like an animal in every single background now. And why not put like a, I don't know, like a space dragon flying in the background? <laughs> and if you knock him off the pit, there's no spikes anymore. But there's a fucking space dragon, and that's a good substitute, you know? And um, I don't know. I, I would really love a Pit 4 or X or whatever they want to call it. And one reason why I do like Pit 3 so much is because it's, it's not just a bridge. It's Shao Kahn's bridge. And when you fall off of it, you fall into spikes that were designed by Shao Kahn for his purposes. And it looks like that. You, you hit a bunch of spinning spikes and you explode. It's not just architecture anymore. It's a torture device. I love that. And I, the little details are so awesome about it. I love the throne so much. Because, I mean, what's so great about the corners and the other pits? They're just, like, generic posts. But you have, I don't know. There's so many little details. That, that is my favorite pit as well. And like you guys said, my favorite stage fatality is indeed the pit, too. I think Shadow specifically said that as well. And, yeah, I mean, it's just... It's such an epic concept, you know? Gore doesn't do much for me anymore, but someone falling off into the troposphere, that does still do something for me. So when the when your bridge is so high up in the air that you're screaming for half a minute, that's that's my thing. I love that. That that makes all the my favorite stages my favorite stages, you know? It's, it's that element of grandeur. And I, I don't like know. The way they did it graphically, like the camera is fixed on the character... So they don't fall, the ground, you watch the ground get closer until they splat. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's almost like, um, it almost kind of it feels like a throwback to the first Batman film with the Joker. I don't know why it reminds me of that, but when the Joker's lying there dead, that's like the final visual you have. Yeah. For me, at least. I don't know why, but, ah, oh, God, and when you do the pit fatality in MK9, it looks so shitty to me. I don't know why, but when you you get a you know an upward camera view of the bridge, and it's not even that high up. It's like, why is this even a big deal? I don't know. That's me. All right. Yeah, <laughs> I, it does feel lackluster. The stage fatality in MK9. It's overdone. I don't think I need to see organs poking out as they slide down the spikes. Oh, yeah, it's just that's very less deception-y. Deception yeah, they're just trying yeah. to shock you with horror, but it's it's less about the presentation and. Like just like we've kind of covered this, just it you can you can overdo gore as much as you want. You can show a spleen there. That's not the thing that makes you go, oh gosh. It's it's all in just how you present it, and like you said, it just isn't presented as well as it could be. Like the MK two is far me, more like, presentation wise, like just scary and they, shocking. Feels to me like if they like hit the spikes and slide and just kind of hang. It's you're not, they didn't land with as much force as if they had hit the bottom completely and the spikes were just poking out of their body. Right. Exactly. Like I don't like that there's still like air between them and the ground. Yeah, those have to be some pretty dull spikes to <laughs> stop your body from going all the way through. <laughs> In a nutshell, what they need to do is make it more realistic, as realistic as is possible. And even if that means that we don't get to see organs popping out of a body while you're going down a spike, less is more and. The more realistic and the more terrifying it actually looks, the more you could believe. Look at this and believe I could see this happening to someone if we were if if that person was in that situation. That's where you shudder inside. Well, another problem I have with the MK9's pit stage fatality is you always get the same animation. I mean, how hard would it have been to give us maybe three or four different ways that a an opponent could actually land? It would give you that something. Too. It'd give you something to keep watching. It would make you want to watch it every single time because it gets to the point where you're like, well, it's been there, done that. I don't really, this isn't really cool to see this after, 
you know, five or six times. You're just like, oh, he's always going to land on those individual spikes right there. He's always going to get one in the head, one in the spleen or whatever, his stomach, and then you're going to see it on the sitting on the spike, and he's going to go slide halfway down, and that's it. And then that's how it goes every single time. How about one where he completely misses the spikes and hits the ground, so you get your MK2 you know, approach, and then also you can mess with camera angles for the individual ones. You could get ones, like you said, where he hits a couple spikes, one where he goes all the way through, one where he takes, I don't know, there's just so many different ways you could do that. I mean, clearly there's only so many ways you can fall off a bridge and go through spikes, but like I said, there's different things could hit the spikes. It, it could just be a lot more free animation rather than canned, here's how he's going to land every single time, and... I just feel like I, there's lost potential there. I feel like I'd have liked to see... I mean, they've got... When you actually fight in the pit bottom in MK9, there's, like, Oni roaming around in the background, like, feasting on bodies and stuff. Yeah. And, like, Reptile supposedly did the same thing back in MK1, and that's why you fight him down there, because he kind of, like, lives down there and eats the corpses. I'd have liked to see one where, after you land, like, one of those Oni or Reptile himself actually comes up and starts, like, chewing on your body as it fades out. Right. And That'd be cool. That's just like that's the details that they could add. I mean, it. I don't know. I just that that always kind of bothered me that there's only one animation. And sure, that's that's the standard. But at the same time, come on, give us a couple more. Give us some yeah, variety there, right? Like, give it's us too one specific where specific to be good repetitively. Yeah, it's yeah, it's way too specific. I mean, give us one where they they flip over after the uppercut or whatever. And they're landing face first. That would look a lot more impactful. Or one where they go head first. Or one where they go feet first and just break their legs. Or take a spike up through their body. You know, just something yeah. like going vertically. That would just look extremely awful. But that's the kind of variety we could. I mean, you're literally taking your same animation and just rotating where the body lands and how it interacts with the the spikes. And also whether it hits the spikes at all. Like I said, you could have given us three or four or five options even and that that can't possibly have taken too long and it would have been a lot more enjoyable because every time you do it you're going to be hoping to see a specific one and you can make them have different rarities between them like percentages of how often they happen like maybe the one where you miss the spikes happens very rare like maybe one in 50 so that way you're always looking for it it gives you a reason to keep doing it if but, they were actually if they were actually seriously go out there and watch a faces of death video or something like that Note to our viewers, if you actually watch Faces of Death video, I'm not responsible for your nightmares, but <laughs> I think it's actually time that we do see a bigger emphasis on people just, I don't know, someone just landing face first or skull first, like, on a flat ground and not just spikes, because that in and of itself, if it's implemented right, is nasty. I mean, yeah, MK2 kind of creeped us out a little bit back when maybe we were kids, but have you ever actually seen the aftermath of someone falling from a really high space, it's like a goddamn water balloon is bursting. They don't explode like they did in the Sky Temple, but the effect is something that's best seen and not discussed. Or best just not seen in general. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we don't condone. Don't, don't go out there and watch Faces of Death. We're not. I don't recommend it. Yeah, I've heard of that. Isn't that where you're le legitimately just seeing people die? Yes, you know, yes, you literal are. Literal snuff film, don't. You know. I wouldn't call it a snuff film. But it's, well, maybe if you're getting yourself off to it, it is. But. Then you I don't, don't, have to say, I don't <laughs> endorse that either. Then you need to turn off this podcast right now and go get some help. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh. No, seriously. Just yeah. Just looking to make it a bit more realistic in its delivery, and then you'll have fatalities that really, really do shock. And there's and there's a thing there's we've already discussed this and we'll have a an episode I'm sure dedicated to fatalities in general but less is more I mean there can be subtle things that just like somebody walking into Quan Chi's blade was far more creepy and effective than all the decapitations and you know taking people's limbs off or head explosions or Anything like that, just because it's all about how you present it, and like I said, subtlety can go a long way. But but yeah, that's our 10 through 6. Tune in next week, same bat time, same bat channel, for 5 through 1. 
But uh, before we get to our character retrospective, let's uh, let's get into the news that was released this week. Also, if you guys want to leave comments on what you think our 5 through 1 is, the best guess, we'll mention it on the show. Like, whoever gets the most right of our 5 through 1, I would love to see what people think and people's guess what our 5 through 1 ends up being. But yes, uh, Temp, why don't you uh, read off some of the new things that have been revealed or found out in about MKX in the uh, PlayStation experience. Yeah, Sean Emmerich uh, revealed a lot of details for the game, and um, I'm going to try to go through this in order of importance, or at least what what seems most important to me for what we're going to see development-wise. Uh, he confirmed that the select screen is not final, and the number of characters in the in the roster will be determined by how much they can get finished in development time. That's, and that, that's huge to me. What's that's I, I feel like that's pretty standard with each game that we get. I mean, don't they always say that, you know, the select screen's not final, the select screen's not final, that, that yeah, may yeah. not be the total number of characters, and we're always going to... They always say they're going to just try and fit in as many as they can, and, of course, with time being a factor and balancing and all that, but, I mean, I feel like that's something that's never I really don't... not the case. Yeah, My really question when we that. hear news like that is, how long ago did they finish the script to story mode and rendering the cutscenes for that? Because you got to I mean, are they just leaving holes open so they can plug in characters when they get them done? And like, yeah. Because, like, let's say they had been working on Rain because they wanted to put him in MK9. Well, story mode was done and Rain wasn't anywhere in it, so. <laughs> yeah. Or, like, I Scarlet, guess. maybe. Yeah. Maybe it's like Scarlet, where they had they had her in story mode, but she was always like just a background cameo, and like she was unfinished when the game came out. That's why there's some data for her on the disc, but it's incomplete. Yeah. And then we got her as DLC because they finished her. Well, that that's that's the strange part because the other part of the news was the game is about to be submitted for its final stage of development. So if they're still making characters. Who's testing these characters? That's my thing. It's like, okay, you made a character in March. Is he, is he balanced? Is, is he going to be competitive? I mean... Uh, well, I think that Sean did actually say that, like, right now, they're starting to march in, like, the pro-level players, and they've got, like, a small army of them. We're actually up there right now. I think right 300 now, the was the yeah, number. 300 of them. Yeah, yeah I like, can't testing imagine... testing every matchup. I can't imagine them adding any new characters at this point. I feel like they have a pretty good idea of the final roster... And any character that's going to make it in the game has already is already being worked on and probably being finished up as we speak. I mean, at this point in the game, especially if they're submitting for final editing and all that, the state, the final stage of development, it's going to be all polishing, all balancing, all tweaking, etc. And then they're going to go gold maybe a month out from release. So that literally gives them what three, four months tops. February. January, February, March, April. So if they release in April, yeah, they have they have essentially about three and a half months of development time at their hands. So they're they're definitely not going to be adding any new characters at this point, in my opinion. Any character that they start now is going to be DLC because they just won't have them done and balanced. So yeah. well, that begs a question too, though. If when the game launches, not counting Goro, do you guys think we're going to get twenty four characters standard? Because I think now I think it might be higher than that. Now I have a feeling we're I, maybe more to twenty six to thirty. Yeah. This entire time I've been betting on twenty six, twenty eight. I never thought twenty four was a realistic number. I what? I'm same boat. I'm twenty six to twenty eight has always been my kind of sweet spot for character wise because that's enough to keep a a good variety going, but also not too much to where it gets. You know, like you start to dip in quality or balance, etc. So I think I'm I'm looking forward to like 26, 28. I can easily see being like 24 at the starting roster, and then maybe two unlockables to go up to 26. I really don't think 24 is going to be the maxed out roster, I've, Goro or not. The the thing is, like, when you look at um, I mean, people were saying 24 because that's about how many we got in Injustice before DLC, right? Yeah, and that select screen was static. That was, uh, I believe, this almost the same select screen from beginning to end from development. Yeah, but we got Mostly. um, how many does MK9 have before DLC? I it mean, had not counting Kratos. I think it had 28? 28 before DLC. Okay, and that's that's when you don't count uh, the bosses because they're not playable. Right. So there's actually like 31 before DLC. 
Yeah. My, my thought is, I don't think there will be unplayable bosses in this game. So that sort of affects the number in my head. Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely... Yeah. I Yeah, I don't see it being 24. I really I kind of want to say that they maybe were thinking 24, because it is the occasional comment that you'll find there amongst fighting gamers that the roster is too big. You'll start getting up to, like, Ultra Street Fighter 4 levels, and it's just a lot of matchups to learn. Yeah. So, so, so maybe they did decide at the beginning to maybe cut back a little bit, not too much, but... I don't know. Perhaps then afterwards they saw there was still a demand for a lot of old characters, and now we know that there are definitely going to be like revenant characters in the game that Quan Chi is controlling dead people. So maybe they did decide to bring back a few dead guys that they weren't going to originally. Is my thing. Is my. Feel. I feel like you don't get, you don't hear the too many characters complaint until you hit about forty. Like, <laughs> and I don't think we're in any danger of that. No, nor do I. But. I just feel like 24 is the standard for them. I mean, I feel like we have this conversation. I don't know. Maybe it's just injustice is clouding my you know perception of the past in general. But I feel like 24 is the standard number that they always start, you know, in the early stages of the game when you first see that select screen. And obviously it does change closer to release usually. But I feel like 24 is always the number that they initially start out. And it's it's going to be something that they always shoot for lower and then deliver more, if not, you know, the exact same. They're never going to give us, you know, a 30 character empty roster screen and then be like, oh, well, sorry, we actually only have 26 because that's going to have a big shit storm of expectations of people already, you know, people already have a problem with managing hype and getting themselves disappointed that that's not going to work out well for them. So I think if anything, they should aim lower with something like 24 and either we get 24 or we get more. It's only going to be better from there. But if you see 24, we're damn sure not getting less than that. Yeah, just my, my concerns yeah. with roster are like, there's so much that they have to squeeze in or have hinted that they're trying to squeeze in. Like, I mean, a lot of people thought, oh, they killed off all those characters in MK9. They, they, that was them getting rid of them so they'd have more room for more characters in the next game. No, apparently they're bringing a bunch of them back as, like, zombies that Quan Chi controls, and some of them will probably be playable. And plus, it's 25 years of characters, and I mean, we're going to see, I think, a lot of uh, NPC cameos, but at the same time, I mean... If you've got a game where they're shoving, you know, a bunch of new guys in and a bunch of returning guys from MK9, and then they got to find room for, you know, a couple from MK4, Deadly Alliance, and Deception to return, it's starting to look pretty stuffed even before you actually talk about, like, names and numbers in specific. Yeah, I'm thinking, like I said, 26 to 28 for starting roster. When it's all said and, de when it's all said and done, you probably have, like, 28, maybe a little bit more. Um... And then we're definitely, I, I think it's a safe bet that we'll probably get more than four characters for DLC this time. And Justice got, what, six? So six, I yeah. think we'll at yeah. least get six. I'd say six to eight is a good bet. So I'm hoping that's where, for eight. Yeah, that's where I think a lot of those zombie characters and more MK4 through Deception and then probably a couple favorites from MK1 through 3 that just didn't make it or that were a cameo in story. I feel like there's so much potential there for more returning characters rather than new characters. I don't see many new characters coming through DLC like that. What I think is going on is they plan... I imagine they plan for all the relevance to, or all the revenants to come back from story mode. And the reason why we didn't get a solid answer on the roster, well, they don't give one that early in development, but they may have not known themselves. What they may have gone for is that, well, we have these, these characters in story mode. If we have time to balance them, They'll be on the roster. If we don't, they'll be NPCs. And we'll just do as many as we can. If we don't get through all the revenants, well, we can attribute to the fact that, you know, they're not that aspect of the story. But if they're in the story mode anyway, then maybe they didn't have to make the... I mean, it's a very unique situation. We've never had a game where characters returned for a not... Well, I guess that's not true either. We had the Conquest Deception mode, Conquest yeah. had a bunch, but they, like, stripped out their special moves to so they wouldn't take up as much space and stuff like that. Yeah. So perhaps, maybe that's what they're doing. They're balancing the revenants. If they can't get it done on time, well, that's your roster. That's the stopping point. So may maybe that's what's happening. Because that, that way you don't, have to, you don't have to trim story mode or you don't have to pump up story mode. You just you work with what you have, I guess, you know? 
Yeah. I can yeah. really see them having added a couple of revenants at the eleventh hour, going, you know what? It's like they have a large presence in story mode anyway. What what kind of dialogue do we need to record? Grr, arg. And there you go. That could be Goro. It's like just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was all of Goro's dialogue in MK9. Yeah, pretty much. All like, right, Reptile let's... didn't even get that. Like, Reptile got whispers, so... <laughs> mumble, mumble. What's, what's the, the next bit of news? <laughs> Yet, Baraka can say a full sentence with no lips. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, what do we got? Um, the abilities are confirmed to not be in MKX. Now, I'm hoping this is a fake out, but it's probably not. This makes me a little sad because his justification was that they do not fit this new style of Mortal Kombat. And I, I cringe when I read that. Yeah, uh, yeah. I didn't not, understand I, I know that how either. You're feeling there. Uh, like, what does that I mean? Are we going darker? If we're going darker, then you I know, like we're going. Uh, we're kind of going for that. Like, let's take ourselves just a wee bit more seriously. MK4 tone again. But yet they yeah. have somebody sticking bubble gum over a bullet wound. I mean, you can't... yeah, right. I mean, I mean, they uh, can work the sense of humor in there. And I mean, even MK4 had it. I mean. Most of our like inside jokes on this show are stuff that was said in MK4 endings. <laughs> but um, I just feel like there's no contradiction. I feel like you can have a really dark game, and you can have some dude turn into a baby. I feel like there's no yeah, dissonance yeah, you don't, there. You don't have this to. This is be... not a babality. This is a fatality. <laughs> Serious pants on now. Take that, Jarek. <laughs> yeah, but you don't. Over you don't have to like be super gritty and spell the word extreme with an X. No e on the front to have friendships and babalities. Oh god, that's the worst part. I want friendships. I, I want friendships. Don't so make bad, it. Yeah. There's not a fan oh. of salt that doesn't want friendships back. How could you not want friendships back? I miss friendships so much. They were hilarious. They're so creative and funny. Like yeah, totally. And that's and that's what our common thing is. You know, the fatalities. It seems like the well has gone dry on like creative ideas on how to you know, make a good fatality that's not going back to the same split in half, decapitate, take off a limb type of things like that. And now we're getting the holes going through them, their bodies, etc. It's like the wells clearly run dry and all, you know, you get your diamonds in the rough, of course. There's still, you know, five or six real ones that stand out in each game. But at the same time, it's like with friendships, it's a whole new ball game because it's completely creative based on a character's theme and clearly they're meant to be funny and i thought the babalities were far more creative in that aspect so yeah i would love to see friendships implemented i don't know i just i i want to know what's going through their heads because they know babalities were so well received and i would want to think they know that people are tired of seeing characters get split down the middle so how did they put two and two together and come to the conclusion that people don't want friendships or rivalities in a Mortal Kombat game? Uh, and okay, they did not deconfirm friendships. That that's still a possibility. It's not looking likely. It's just but, the yeah the statement yeah. of it's not you know that's not what we're going for in this MK that kind of gives you that impression. But yeah, I don't know. It's just I'd be weirded out if there are friendships in the game and they thought friendships were okay but rivalities were not. I mean, I'd be a little relieved. But that seems like very strange logic to me. I, I don't yeah. know. I, I don't get it. Yeah. What's next? Uh, weather elements. There's no night and day stages, but we will see weather changes in the environment. Uh, Disappoint? Like, it's like, that's, me that's a bittersweet, that. yeah. That's a bittersweet, because on one hand, of course, we were, you know, like Shadowloo just said, we just talked about in last week's episode how much... You know, night and day stages were great, a great addition to MK9. It really made certain stages shine, and then we specifically said the jungle stage at night could be really awesome, seeing night, our eyes poke through the jungle trees, etc., and fog rolling over, and just so many cool things you can do at night. And now we know we're not going to get that, which absolutely sucks, because, like I said, so many stages that, that really works really well for, and you wouldn't think that, you know, you have the whole stage structure there. You just have to change the lighting and add a couple of extra elements. So you don't, that that's not nearly as, you know, it doesn't take nearly as much effort and time and resources to make a complete new stage as it does to just change the time of day and, you know, other things added on to it. So that's definitely disappointing. But on the other hand, we're getting weather effects, which I don't know if they mean, like, we're going to have a stage that has rain on it, like Shang Tsung's throne room like we were just talking about or 
if certain stages are gonna start off sunny and then all of a sudden it'll get cloudy and start to rain like you know on round two or something or just yeah, throughout it, the fight will it be like a, a choreographed weather or will it be a random engine right and i'm if, thinking like killer instinct is what i'm picturing but that's not random though that's that's triggered by you know the ultra when you do an ultra if stuff it's, changes in the back yeah if it's random then that would be absolutely great if it's choreographed each time then i don't see that as something special that they're adding on because once again Shang Tsung's throne room has rain and storminess, and they've, yeah, they've and proven they can do that, and that's great. As far as, like, a, a changing sky that changes the same way every time, the tower again. Yeah. I and, can see it doing really wonderful things, actually, for the cove if it was completely random. Like, just ha- ha- have some points, just ha- have the entire, like, water surface be dead, creepy, calm. And other times, just have it be a raging torrent, you know? Right, yeah. It's something It'll that. Full thunderstorm. It's something that, you know, the lack of time of day changes a night and day version. It's something that a random weather system like that could certainly really work. And I'm not talking about so random that all of a sudden, you know, the jungles, it's extremely sunny. And then all of a sudden it starts snowing out of nowhere. But there's no reason why on certain stages you can't have that option. Like, for, uh, I don't know. I mean, why why not have sky effects like that and have it start raining randomly on certain stages that call for it and snowing on others and sandstorms on others and hurricanes or tornadoes or i mean obviously nothing that's going to be so drastic that you're changing the way the stage is played but you know you never know what they mean by that and i don't know i'm I'm excited for it the kind of thing we'll have to like see it before we can really judge because like weather could add a lot to a stage like shalu said the cove yeah, it's just a bummer that we're not getting the day and night differences because when we talked about that, it was mostly the suggestion that like some of the stages were I don't know too bright and sunny or not MK enough for us, and the idea was that a night version could add a lot more like creepy elements. Yeah, the more mystical, creepy, yeah, yeah, stuff like that. And sure. like it's a, it's a shame that like what this says to me is the jungle will never be interesting now it'll just be sometimes it's a calm jungle and sometimes it's a rainy jungle and rain sometimes I think, it'll be really steamy and misty yeah i don't know yeah it's definitely something that we don't really know for sure and uh-huh. we'll definitely have to see i'm i'm you know crossing my fingers for a more random dr- dramatic type of appeal to it to where you can have full-blown rain and wind and stuff like that rather than just Sometimes the stage is sunny, and then sometimes there's a little bit of rain going down, and it's always the same kind of cycle, or it's completely random to the point where you start the stage and it's exactly like that. I'd I'd like to see something happen as you fight, or I don't know. I just yeah, it, it's just tough I'm to tell. The, I'm really feeling at this point that we need more stage reveals as badly as we need more character reveals. I don't know how much that they can really give away without spoiling plot elements, but. Holy crap, is it ever hard to talk about something like this when we only have about four stages known to us, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There, there, could, there could be stuff like, you know, like Raiden's Sky Temple or the Nkwe Arctic environment that could really benefit from drastic changes in the environment and the weather. And I can think of a million ways to make those work, but just the ones we've got now, I mean, one picture happening in the Outworld uh, market. Sandstorm? Rain? Not a whole lot to go on. Exactly. Yeah. Well, what adds to that is we're probably not going to get anything until January. I mean, they, he didn't say that. He said we're going to get story elements in January, February, but it doesn't sound like anything's happening for December. So this yeah. is what we got so far. This is what you we're know, dealing with. Weird, weird news drought. Yeah. I want to believe that actually because of the Street Fighter V reveal that they were maybe on the cusp of revealing someone like Kenshi perhaps because, you know, we were all looking at that, that screenshot that Boom put up. But like maybe the maybe the Street Fighter Five reveal kind of made them sit back and go, we kind of have to do something major now to get people's attention because this is just major, gigantic news to be in the same market anywhere near around. I think that I think that we're kind of due for a kind of deception video. Remember the deception video when we just had like thirty quick clips of stage fatalities and characters going, "Who the hell is this guy? Who the hell is that guy? What's this thing?" Is Oh god, that, that slaughterhouse fatality, did you see that? Something to hype us up a little bit like that is perfect for right now. Well, I feel like, I mean, I've been one of the known defenders of their marketing and the slower pace leading up to the more frantic pace and, 
you know, just crazy left and right reveals, you know, leading into the game, the two or three months leading into the game. That's how it always goes. So I feel like, at, but at, but that's something I was defending, you know, seven months out. Now that we're four months out, it's it's getting to that point where if if when January hits, we don't start getting, you know, several stages and, you know, a couple stages and a couple characters at least, you know, per month, then I just, it's getting to be a little bit like what what's going on here because you're, you're coming out in April. So what are you holding back here at this point? Because if you have even remotely, you know, close to the number of stages in MK9, you know, 16 or whatever it was that we said it was, um, you've only, re- you've only revealed four. So, you know, are we just going to start getting a plethora of info here soon or, or what, what is the deal? But I mean, hopefully, hopefully in January we start getting weekly things like a character and a stage and they really pick, you know, set it into higher gear. Even characters, like there's four months left and let's say there's 24 and they revealed eight. That means you have a good 16 characters left to reveal. Yeah. Is my math right on that? Did I do that right? Yeah. Yes. Anyway, but yeah, so <laughs> I don't know. I, I just, how are you, are you going to reveal like five characters a month now? Are you just going to not reveal characters? I know some people would love that. I, I am not one of those people. I feel like even if you are into this kind of marketing, it's not hype. And some people don't, are, are okay with that. They're not into the hype. You know, they're not into that, you know, that, that train of energy approaching the game. But I am. And yeah, I, I, mean, I, I need yeah. some hype here. I'm, I want to be excited to buy this game. And right now I'm totally met on it. Well, I think yeah, I the problem that. is we've gone like a month without anything. Like, there's there's one. It's one thing to kind of string you along and give you, uh, you know, a breadcrumb here and there. But in the past month, have we gotten anything? I mean, we the last the last character reveal I think it's we been had was two Quan, months since we got anything because we had Quan Chi was the last character revealed, and that feels like a good deal of time ago at this point. I mean, any Quan Chi talk in discussion. And an, uh, analyzation, analysis, whatever, it, it's you know it's gone now. It's time for something new. Like I, that was another example. Is I didn't want characters revealed too much at once, or you know stages, because I didn't feel like we'd give them the proper analysis each time they came out. But it's like we're not even talking about Quan Chi at this point, and we haven't been in you know three or four weeks. So let's uh, let's bring on the next character here. What? <laughs> What's, well, what's no, going I'm, on? I'm pretty sure it has been two months because this this is episode eight, right? Correct. Yeah, we talked about Quan Chi on episode one, so that yeah. right there is eight weeks. That's true. That's very. Well, true. we know the we know the girl gameplay video is coming soon at some point. They that I think that that is one of the things that uh, we're talking about here that, that that Sean brought up. That's coming. Yeah, that will tie me over for a week or so, I think, and then after that, I think I really need to see that deception quick beat that's going to just drive me insane with split-second teasers of characters, you know? Well, I'm, I'm hoping when they reveal, you know, the story stuff, we'll see a bunch of characters. Yeah, it's likely that that'll be the big blowout, basically. But, I yeah, think... they gotta just, they gotta give us a little bit more something to keep us talking. I mean, that's that's always good. It doesn't always have to be a character or a stage, but just something. Even if it's, like, little teasers or nuggets of info. I mean, we got the boot teasers, but... I mean, give us something else here. I mean, it does like I said, it doesn't have to be everything, but just even like little breadcrumbs here and there, definitely to keep everyone interested. I mean, uh, a game that I can think of right off the top of my head that we just I talked a lot about in the last episode is Smash Brothers, and leading up to their release, you know, even like a year ahead of time, he uh, Sakurai does the pick of the day, and he does it every single day except for weekends. He does a a new picture from the game and. He reveals characters through there sometimes and stages and items and, you know, so much. But he always has something to show, even if it's even if it's nothing like new information wise. It's a new picture to just kind of look at and talk about and, you know, discuss. And it's like even if it's just stuff that we've already seen, just give us something. Show us a a background detail of the stage that nobody really noticed or give us a hint of the weather effects that you're talking about or a game mode. Give us something other than just Ed Boon giving us wild hints, talking about yeah, random his, things. his cheeky mind games. It doesn't really move the needle for me. <laughs> you know who would be perfect to reveal right now? One of the Revenants. Because, you know, they redesigned their characters with every go, and they're not just going to port over a character with MK9's graphics. No, like, 
any people I'm, I'm predicting now under Quan Chi's control are going to be twisted and perverted to spy him to something less than maybe less than human looking, maybe demonic, maybe I don't know, nether realm influence. So yeah, my, if they show us if they show us one person out of our old dead friends like that, we're going to go insane speculating and maybe even drawing how these people could look now that we haven't seen yet. Give us one revenant, and that'll get us buzzing for two months straight. Yeah, like, the big question that burns for me when it comes to those characters is, will they all be the same kind of undead? Will they all have unique powers, like how Scorpion is different from Noob Cybot? You know, are they just going to be, like, an army of noobs? What's... And, I mean, one picture won't answer that question, but it'll certainly, you know, get people talking about it. All he knows when January hits... If we don't have something to... We should have something to discuss about MKX in some sort of great length or detail every single week. There's no reason why we should have episodes that completely have no MKX talk. I mean, I, I understand, you know, two or three or four weeks ago, that's fine. But once we're getting to the new year and you literally only have four and a half months left before the game is in our hands, we we should be having weekly discussions and something new to you know kind of talk about and it could be a picture it could be a video it could be a character reveal a game mode reveal it could be hints it could be speculation it doesn't matter but then there's a point where we've talked about literally everything we feel we could talk about so i feel like it's kind of <laughs> damning at this point you know cuz even if february comes around and they reveal the whole roster the marketing I mean, it was like when it, with MK9, you know, when, when we finally found out everything there was to find on MK9, I was still like, well, the marketing was ass, you know, and people were like, how can you say that? We have all this information. And I'm like, but that doesn't retroactively make the marketing better. That doesn't yeah, make the like, marketing for August. Most October. of the information yeah. we had was leaked. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't want that getting out. And, you know, if that, I mean, every time they wait to reveal a character, they take that risk. I mean, the Street Fighter V trailer was leaked. The fucking the, the debut trailer fucking leaked. I mean, God, I don't know. Like for me, yeah, it only leaked like half a day ahead of time. Yeah, I mean that that is true, but I don't know. I, I feel like, I mean, I don't know if we're doing a marketing episode in the future. It'd be cool if we did, but I, I feel like for those on this side of the fence, you can't really win because if you say there's not enough information, you know, people are like, well, it's a business, you know, it's a corporate entity. They don't owe you anything. And they're right. That, that's absolutely true. But, you know, if you get tidbits, these unsatisfying crubs, crumbs, you know? Well, the thing and you're is, like, yeah? I'm on the side of the fence that's, like, always defending their marketing and is like, no, yeah, the pacing's fine. It'll really crank up, and that's the way I prefer it. But it's like, okay, now's the time where it needs to crank up. <laughs> like, I'm getting, <laughs> I'm the one that's defending them, and even now I'm getting impatient. Like, come on, give us something to talk about right now. I want... <laughs> I want to be doing these episodes and being excited, like, can't wait to be able to discuss something that was revealed. And we just haven't had that since we've started this podcast eight weeks ago. We have not had one episode where we're like, we got to talk about this. I cannot wait. We've just been basically, we caught up on the things that were revealed before we yeah, started. There, there has been no new news since we started the show. <laughs> Other than this. And this is like the newest thing we've gotten. Cause they even yeah, did, it, it's just an interview. Yeah. And they, they even did their stream, and which didn't really have much other than like, you know, little gameplay, you know, things to discuss, which we never got around to yeah, doing. They, they answered some but, interesting questions like how Quan Chi's uh, ground buffs work right right but i mean even that it's just like there's just never there hasn't been that huge that huge reveal i mean it like i said a character or a stage would be awesome it would at least give us something to discuss for you know whatever length of time but even just details like give us something like i said even a picture i really don't care just give us something that we can talk about mkx every single week that's how it should be leading into the game and now it's it's finally to the point where i'm getting impatient and when i'm getting impatient on you know mr defend your marketing and your slow burn method then you know you have a problem because i'm losing interest in talking about it and that's not a good thing <laughs> just give well, us that's something. why i put you in a separate camp though because i feel like the people who are def like like right now defending the marketing they don't they're not defending it because they think the marketing is good they're defending it because they secretly don't want anything revealed to to release they want that onslaught of information you know and uh yeah, yeah that's not uh, what i want at all i just want yeah i just want I, th I think yeah go ahead i mean to use a, a no no offense to anyone out there but I, the term i like to use is like 
the the guy who goes spoilers. You know, like, <laughs> it's just those people drive me crazy. Like, you, I, oh, you shouldn't have spoiled that for me. I wanted to be surprised. You came into the thread and read it of your own free will. You can control that. If you go on NeoGAF, you get people there all the freaking time who are like, okay, that's it. This is the point where I'm out. I'm going on a media blackout. I didn't, just I didn't drive by your house yelling, Snape kills Dumbledore. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Snape kills Dumbledore? Yeah, what? okay. <laughs> No warning on that one. Great. Yeah, there was a hilarious video about that when that first I was going to marathon those that. tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, but you know, if they do reveal breadcrumbs and I complain about it, they're not, oh, this is a corporate entity anymore. They're like, oh, you ungrateful bastard. How dare you talk shit when they give you something? And I'm like, I can't win. Either it's a, I mean, which is it? Is it a corporate entity or is it my parents? Am I ungrateful or... I just, I can't win, I feel like. If you want to talk about it as, like, a corporate thing, how many other video games are this sparse with the news? I mean, other fighting games usually reveal their rosters at a pretty steady pace, and even other WB games, like the Batman games, have not, you know, been secretive. I mean, they've... Yeah. I mean, Arkham uh, Knight hasn't revealed that much gameplay, or at least it didn't for a long time, but that's because they were still working on the game. We still knew a ton of stuff about the game... But that's also month by a month by month as it's been coming out. Right. And it's not even a comparable thing, though, in my opinion. <laughs> and and that's simply because a fighting game revealing fighters should not be, you know, a, a game like Arkham Knight or Arkham City or whatever is a very story driven game. It's hard to reveal something without it giving something away because the biggest things to reveal are story related content other than, you know, gameplay upgrades, which they have shown thus far. And it's been great, and it's amazing. I can't wait for that game. I'm getting off track here. I'm like slowly <laughs> like, let's talk about Arkham Knight. <laughs> well, I'm just, I'm just using that as an example to say like it's not like a WB policy. Yeah. NetherRealm Studios yeah, right. is the one deciding the pace. Yeah. Yeah. And the worst part so is much like their finished product to be able to drag us along like this. They must really think this is going to knock us out of the, our collective socks. And hey, if there is something that is absolutely amazing then that that's awesome. I can't wait for that day. But, I mean, I feel like that day should be sooner rather than later because it's getting, like you said, the last big reveal has been two months or whatever it's been, eight weeks. And that's just absolutely, ugh, I just can't believe that the last character we've had revealed to us is Quan Chi and it's been that long already. It doesn't, it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, I don't know, I'm just... Maybe you guys can relate to this, but... with with, with... With the new Arkham game, when I play it, I'm going to be playing as Batman. So at least that mystery is solved. I'm not <laughs> naming any of these characters. I'm not using... Well, no, that's, that's not entirely true. You also might be playing sometimes as Harley Quinn, they've revealed. Yeah. And or Red the Red Hood. Hood. Okay, yeah. let's, that, I mean, that's, that's more than MKX than what we, what we got right now. I just... I don't know. I'm, you I don't know 100% of Arkham Knight's roster. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's beautiful, too, and I, oh, God, I don't know. Like, I, I don't mean to be bitter, because some people have said that we sound bitter, but I don't I don't want to come across that way. The things I like, I really like. The things I love about the series, I hold very close to my heart, but, I mean, I call it like it is. If something seems shitty to me, that I'm going to say it's shitty. I'm not going to pretend to like something, you know? Well, that's why it we're all four on this podcast, because we all should be speaking to different people, because clearly we all have our own separate opinions and sometimes we agree sometimes we disagree i'm Cut saying out. for the people that have been patient such as myself i'm getting impatient and it's about time we got something new so if there's anybody more right. patient than me on this you know kudos to you sir but like this is just getting absolutely ridiculous because there's no there's nothing i mean at this point what's the <laughs> what is the big secret because why can't we get an image of somebody a new character reveal why can't we get concept art of a new character reveal like it doesn't always have to be like i said it it, it feels like with them it's all or nothing they either give you a, a they either show you a character with an arena usually or they show you absolutely nothing and it's like it shouldn't have to be that way there's no reason yeah. why we can't get consistent nuggets of information uh, an image or concept art or you know con like what is the harm in showing us a concept art of another character that hasn't been revealed I mean, like he's gonna be in the game you don't know what he looks like yet but here's at least something to hold you over until next week when we show you the full reveal 
and yeah, you know, they, blow the lid off that or show you. That's basically how they marketed Deadly Alliance. The first thing they released was concept art of like, you know, Draman and Movado and all these Sub-Zero. characters. Sub-Zero. That yeah, was no, yeah. hype. Right. And what, yeah, what's the Sub-Zero the art was awesome. It? It's like, I why? think they actually probably would have gone the full length and given us like a sil- like an actual real character select screen full of silhouettes, but they might have thought that we've gotten too good at guessing. Yeah, right. And I mean, it's just like even give us a give us a picture of the model in Maya or whatever the hell you make your models in. Give us a picture of the grayed out model with no detail, no lighting, no texture, and just let us sit here and Google over the freaking amazement of their attire of you know say it's Fujin or something and be like oh my god look at the way Fujin looks now and it's completely you know just a just a unrendered image of his model and just let us talk about that for a week until you show us the full reveal video like why is it always like I said it's either all or nothing it doesn't have to be this big secret we're gonna buy your game so why are you making it seem like you have to keep everything hush hush from us when all you're doing is irritating people at this point Especially when Killer Instinct is doing it perfectly right now. Killer Instinct is so good at revealing characters. And my god, they they have enough characters where they could do that with MKX. And it would would work so well. Like, let's say the next character they reveal is Fujin. And they have his gameplay trailer. And at the end of the trailer, there's a cinematic. And, like, Fujin's like, are you sure you want to do this? And then Mocap turns around and is like, yes, I do. And then it just cuts off. That's a teaser. (laughs) Like, that would be cool. Well, not mocap, but I mean, like, that would be hype is what I mean. I'll tell you, mocap would make me hype. Because I'd be like, what the fuck are they thinking? I gotta okay, know more. No, no, yeah, no, no, Smash Bros. No. was the same. They'd always have, like, a... They, they'd reveal a, a character, a new character or whatever, and then they would have some sort of teaser for another character or something like that. Or they would do the new character reveals in a nice cinematic trailer, but then they would do the returning characters on, you know, their website or whatever. I mean, I know it's not the same thing because the character, I don't know, it's just, I'm getting tired of explaining. It just should be such a simple concept of keep people talking about your game. That's the whole point. And yes, we're talking about the game, but we're forcefully talking about the game because we're on a podcast where we need to talk. (laughs) But if we didn't do this show, there's nothing to say. So that's a problem. Just gotta break it and say, you gotta remember, folks. Like, if if we sound like we're being impatient or whiny or negative, remember the remember the golden rule. We bitch because we love. Like Temple was saying earlier, these are things that we hold sacred and we want to see them go places. We're not complaining because we're dissatisfied, we're complaining because we want to know more. We're anxious. And remember, if we sound like we're being negative about something, well, what's what's so great about ta- about talking about things that are always wonderful? No real great debate or conversation comes out of an incredibly positive environment where things can be wine and roses. You know, strife is the mother of conversation. Just keep that in mind. We're not, we're not just shitting on things for no reason. It's constructive criticism. And we're doing it because we care about the details. And we're doing yeah, it because we have nothing else to do. I mean, that's also the pastime. That. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm and just saying, know, we're doing a podcast yeah. leading into MKX. And though we're a podcast that covers the whole MK series in general, and, you know, that's what we're going to stick to. But at the same time, the whole point is to have focus on MKX going into MKX. The fact that we have to do top ten lists about the past and just, like, cover so much of the past games before the game, the new game even comes out kind of sucks because what are we going to do when there's no mkx you know we're gonna we're gonna have everything covered because mkx won't reveal anything for us to talk about and we're, we're gonna a, do that uh long-awaited annihilation rift tracks that's what we're gonna do yeah and that'll be great but it's like come on you gotta give us something here and i'm not saying something for the show i'm saying something for all of us mk fans whether it's the show or not or whether something like this exists or not it's the fact that you should always want people to keep talking on forum boards on facebook whatever on on other gaming websites you should always have that in the public eye and i understand that you don't have an unlimited supply of stuff that's always been my argument is they only have so much to show but we're currently i think exactly five months out whenever the game releases five months and a few days and um what well here's come on here's what i've always said if you have a roster of 24 then 
starting from like a year till the game comes out, you could release a character every two weeks. Yep. There's exactly. really, yeah, there's really no reason not to, and I yeah, just I, don't understand it anymore. I was also going to go out on a limb and assume that the very existence of some of, some of these characters that we've yet to see is probably going to constitute spoilerificness in and of itself. You know, if, if we're really not actually done seeing relatives of characters or sons or daughters of relatives past, then, yeah, maybe it makes a lot of sense that they're going to want to keep those as a secret. You know, there's everyone's kind of hoping that the, lo- that the roster is not going to be folded entirely up by a bow. Yeah, yeah, like if, if you show me the son or daughter of Liu Kang and Katana, you just spoiled that they both come back from the dead. Right. There we go. But that's the thing, is there more there's more to the game than just characters. There's there's information about the fighters that have been revealed. There's there's little like I said, you can do little nuggets of you can show off a fighter as being in the game, but just don't show off the gameplay yet and use that as the hook for the next week to come back <laughs> And check that out and talk and like just talk about what the character looks like and then give us the gameplay and like have us discuss that for a week. The point is there's several ways to do it to keep people talking but not all you know use all your assets at once or whatever the hell that is that expression is that escapes me right now. But I mean there's stages there's game modes there's uh, there's unlockable. Yeah we still don't know a single thing about that persistent online mode. And and the thing is, we'll know about this eventually. We'll know about everything, but you know, almost everything before the game releases. That's not the problem. It's that yeah. why are you cramming everything together when give us something to talk about each week, just something little, but something that we can talk about for thirty minutes or on a, on a forum that can go you know multiple posts and give us something to speculate on because speculation is good. But if you're going to give us two characters at once, then that means one of those characters isn't going to get the attention, you know, the other does because whoever is more popular is going to get more attention. Whereas if you space things out appropriately, but not too far, it gives everybody time to be talked about. Like you said, every two weeks is perfect because two weeks is more than enough time to talk about somebody and cover every little detail. And then when you're finally done with that here, you know, here comes the next thing to talk about. Yeah. The thing for me is like you said, you don't need to be mysterious with us because we're going to buy the game anyway, and I don't know that that's the right attitude to have. I mean, I don't feel like this game has been sold to me yet. I'm not sure I'm going to buy it yet, and I'm sure the entire audience will go, you're on a Mortal Kombat podcast, of course you're going to buy it. Don't be an asshole. And maybe they're right, but... <laughs> <laughs> maybe they're right, and I have nothing else to I say. Just... <laughs> <laughs> maybe they're right, they're, silence. They're, they're probably right. I'm almost a guarantee. The, the thing is, I don't want to be, like, treated like, oh, you'll buy right, it anyway. Right. We don't have to show you anything. That shouldn't be their mentality. I'm just saying, as, I mean, I feel like you, with your, okay, I should have specified, with your diehard audience, you shouldn't have to act like everything's the new, like, the is completely new. We, we, we know that, I mean, we speculate that certain characters are going to be in. So if, if, say they release, you know, Fujin or Ermac, trailer or just even a picture of him is that something that's going to like ruin the game no i mean that's this, like i said this isn't a story driven game where the slightest reveal could completely blow the lid off everything and spoil everything this is a game where you can release a picture a fighter gameplay or stages or game modes and not have it ruin the game whatsoever it's a fighting game the the big thing that's going to carry it over is the gameplay and the tournament players that keep sticking with it it's not the story is yeah. a big thing, but you can you can cherry pick things to not reveal story. I feel like the unless there's something unless half the game's roster, half the stages, and half the game modes completely spoil story mode, which I really have a hard time believing, then I don't understand what the holdup is. Yeah, there's my, no reason my, you should go two months without just, stuff. It's just sort of a, a matter of like managing the hype because if you do sort of take the like, imagine yourself in the shoes of someone who doesn't care that much about Mortal Kombat, might buy the game, but isn't sold yet. It's like, well, if we if we show them the big hype thing that will get them excited to buy the game right now, then in four months, that hype will have been worn off, and they'll not be excited anymore. Right. So There's you don't, you don't blow your load early, but at the same time, you don't just go complete silent until, exactly. you know, like a month before the game is out. You gotta... If you pace it, you can keep people constantly excited over like that entire period of time. By all means, that's what I've been saying 
That's that's my big defense for yeah. their marketing is that, you know, I don't want them to show us the best things when they're still like six or seven months out because then it's like it's only downhill from there, which sucks. It should be getting progressively better leading into the game. But like I said, we're five months out now and we haven't gotten something new in two months to talk about. That's unacceptable. It's just well, I do not accept that. Please this keeps <laughs> up. change that. <laughs> if this keeps up, I'm going to have to start making up my own news stories, folks. Right, we should just start <laughs> yeah, doing um, whatever. Okay, so the Tekken guys don't want Lucky Chloe. Can we have her? Will she fit MK10? No. And that's pretty I sad. Don't know about that. And that's pretty sad if a Mortal Kombat <laughs> podcast is going to start talking about other fighting game news because you aren't giving us anything to talk about. Well, Tekken Seven's marketing so much better right now, so it's it's a hard. Uh, here's my thing: like with hype, uh, people say hype is good because it generates sales, because it garners interest. Maybe the, all that's true, but that's not why I want hype. Hype has its own intrinsic value to me. I want hype for hype's sake. When you go to a tournament. And everyone's screaming in front of the the top eight for Street Fighter Four. You know, people aren't like you know throwing their fists in the air saying, "Yeah, we're going to sell so many copies of Street Fighter Four. No, no one. I don't care about that. I want the hype for itself. It has its own value to me. You know. Now I think that's what a lot of people in the forums just aren't getting. You know, I don't really care how many copies MKX sells sells, so long as it sells enough to, to warrant a sequel. With a respectable budget. That is all I'm after. I mean, if I get that, you know, I'm, I'm not seeing royalties for this game. You know, I'm not going to benefit if they sell 8 million copies unless the next game has the most ridiculous budget of all time. And yeah, I mean, Tekken 7 is doing a great job. Killer Instinct is doing a great job. So that's where I put the bar. And, well, hey, I, you know, it's funny. Well, what's up? Yeah, I'm just saying I think it's a win-win. I mean, I, I, I'm somebody that, you know, I want them to succeed as much as they possibly can i'm not gonna lose sleep if they don't (laughs) i'm not gonna you know as like you said as long as they can make a sequel then i'm a happy guy i mean i'm not gonna get any happier if they sell one million versus two million but i mean if they sell nine million i'm like that's freaking awesome that means a lot of mortal Kombat fans and that means the forums are gonna get you know refreshed again there's gonna be tons of new members we're gonna get tons of conversations going ton you know Tons more support, bigger budget for blah, blah, blah. I've already said all this, but the point is it can be a win-win. There's no reason why yeah. one translates to the other. You use, you know, you shouldn't have to withhold information to get more sales because that's just not, that's not the case. There's so much, there's, if your game has so little content that you can't keep people, you know, satisfied and happy, uh, nine months from, you know, nine, starting at nine months before release or whatever then don't reveal your game nine months ahead of time. Reveal your game six months ahead of time and then give us a crap load of content going forward. There's no re- If you're going to reveal your game almost a year ahead of time, then have the content to keep people interested. It's just as simple as that. And I know a Mortal Kombat game has enough content to keep people satisfied. They're just choosing not to do it. It's just like Smash Brothers, that example. You could be showing us pictures every day. It doesn't always have to be new But it could be something that we can make new and find new things to discuss. But you're not doing that. You're not putting forth any community effort to keep people satisfied or interested other than Ed Boon's Twitter, you know, tweets. But it just that's not that's not anything. That's nothing. There's no reason why from seven to five months, there's nothing. There's no new information. That's absolutely unacceptable. It just doesn't make any sense. And we reveal stuff at the last minute. You can't change it, because what if the fan reaction is bad, as it was with Chloe? I mean, I can't speak for the Japanese crowds, but in America, she wasn't terribly well-received. I think even in Japan, people are tired of Kotaku bait. So if you reveal a character like that, you know, on the horizon of the release, you I mean, you can't undo a character, obviously. But you can maybe make adjustments. Like, let's say the game mode is not positive or positively received of uh, the wager system and injustice was not positive or positively received i don't know if that went through any changes um but there's that there's that dialogue that's possible in march a dialogue is not going to matter anymore even in january i don't know how much dialogue is going to matter well i think even even that close to release it's like okay you're covering that close to release but what are you doing now fix Fix the current problem that I see right now, and that's from yeah. seven months to five months, or whatever, to, in a two-month 
time period from the seventh month out and five month out time period, you've given us you've given us absolutely nothing exciting to discuss. That is that like I said, it just doesn't make any sense. There's no reason why you couldn't have fit a stage or something in there to keep people talking. There's no reason why more than two weeks should go by without something to discuss. It doesn't have to always be something major, and I feel like that's their problem, as they think, well, we're either going to show a stage, a character, which usually go hand in hand. They usually show a character with a new stage, which is I feel is a mistake if they if they can better manage their things by showing them separately, then do it. Yeah. And uh, they're gonna, either going to do that or they're going to do a new game mode that they're going to reveal. And those are the only three things they have to show off. And that that just feels completely wrong. There's more things you can show. Just little, why can't we see behind the scenes stuff? Little, little snapshots of something and hints at this. We should be constantly being engaged by them to keep interest in their game. I don't know. I, mean, I wish I, they'd answer for that. I wish there was an explanation. They never even addressed it with MK9. Because you're right, they could space it out like that. It would work perfectly, but... I don't know what they're thinking. I don't... Well, what's up, Razor? Well, I, I wonder if the reason they're holding off is, like... It occurred to me, he said, like, late January or February we'll get, like, story stuff. That's the same time the comic starts. Good point. Right, and I... From February, or from even late January to April when the game releases, I'm sure we're going to have a ton of crap to talk about every single week. That's not what I'm afraid of. I'm and and I if they have so much content to jam pack in that area, like I said, unless we're like you know walking on eggshells not to you know reveal anything too revealing that would spoil story. Which, dear God, I can't imagine this Mortal Kombat game being so. I don't know. Maybe we're all completely wrong, and we'll find out in two months or a month from now that oh, that's why they couldn't reveal so much because clearly everything is so unexpected. And once they revealed one, it was like a snowball effect that everything would be pretty much unraveled. And if that's the case, then sure, fine. Then I'll admit that, you know, that's cool and all, but there's, I'll, I'll still maintain there was absolutely no reason why they couldn't give us little nuggets of something to chew on while we get, until we get to the big feast, so to speak. There's just no reason. Yeah. yeah. The point is, the point is we're bored, folks. <laughs> I mean, I guess we'll see you in hinted, two months. <laughs> we've already hinted Johnny Cage, Kenshi, and Jax at the very least. So re- revealing them like two weeks ago isn't going to spoil story mode. <laughs> yeah. So, anyways, moving on. What's next? So on to the news. Um, we now know there's no uh, platform specific characters anymore. Um, there's unplanned for Mortal Kombat X. Every if there's a guest character. It'll be universal to both consoles. That's good news to me. That, I, I mean, if you want full gore, that, that sucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, a, that's am, a bummer for us Killer Instinct fans. <laughs> I am a little well, I love Killer Instinct. By that but... News, but I can, I can deal. At least, at least we'll, as a fan base, be free from that strife of, ugh, you guys got this, haha, we got this, and, well, we can't use this character in tournaments anymore, because it's just, uh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. we're free of that crap. Yeah, console it's, exclusivity it's, sucks. It is a good thing on the whole. Though I'm never going to stop wishing that Fallen Order might sign our <laughs> Yeah, I think that'll come one day. I think that's on the way, but I think it's ironic news given that Street Fighter V is nothing but console-exclusive characters from the roster up, so... <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's, uh... That's well, it sounds like Street Fighter V is trying to be the anti-killer instinct. Well, then that just means one thing. Mortal Kombat needs to go strictly on the Wii U. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, and Link. Guess chameleon <laughs> confirmed with a K. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you know she'll be in a game. Only on mm. It's on a Nintendo console? Guess who's coming to dinner? <laughs> Tekken can go on the Ouya. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody will miss a thing. <laughs> Soul Calibur for uh. PC. And oh, Killer Instinct for PC, maybe I should cheer that. Yeah, cheer about that little bit of news. No. It's about time, um, honestly. That's probably yeah. their answer. I'm cool with this. Well, they're not going to sell more myself. consoles with Ki. What's up? They were going to sell me a Ki console once, uh, like whatever season three was done. But 
if they're just going to bring it to PC, then there is absolutely no need for me to go out and buy what would essentially be a $300 Killer Instinct emulator. I was yeah. going to do this. <laughs> That's yeah. precisely the thing you should not tell Microsoft, because we do mm-hmm. want I'm Killer sorry. Instinct. That's gonna it's hurt true. You. It's true. I, I've been saying it for years. Give me a good Killer Instinct, and I will buy a Microsoft console. And what do they do? They give me Killer Instinct, but they... Give it to me slowly, like I'm on top of the tower. Time dilation is taking effect. Well, yeah, P- PC is, I mean, there was a time when it was always an afterthought, but it's basically, you know, just as big as the consoles now, so why not? Yeah. It's fighting game standard now, so... I mean, mine, uh, mine doesn't run so well. I'm probably still going to get an X-Bone for Christmas, but... All right, what's I am next? Down. I am down with a glorious PC Master Race combo. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's it for news, really. Other than, the, oh yeah, we're gonna get a girl trailer eventually. Yep, yep. Eventually. Any time frame, <laughs> or just eventually? Uh, just eventually. Right now, he didn't specify. All right. Well, I look forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> it'll it'll be nice to see what he can do before putting the money down for the DLC. Right. Yeah. I guess we don't have to do that. You know, marketing episode anymore. So, actually, is, is he even is he even DLC? He's just a pre-order exclusive. Yeah, he's pre-order, which is yeah. So yeah, yeah. The pre-order exclusives always become DLC later. True, but they do all but... pre-order, so I don't I don't have to worry about that. Already done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Shut up and take my money. All right. Well, let's uh let's move on to the Fujin character retrospective because apparently people didn't hear enough about that guy in our uh. Second episode. I was really hoping Sue Howe would win. Me too. If Sue Howe won, I really wouldn't have had anything <laughs> to say. I would have just been like, yeah, he was once rumored to be Shao Kahn, and uh, he, he, he he wasn't. You're thinking of Reiko, buddy. <laughs> no, it was the... What was the guy? Oh, right, when they called him... Yeah. Kahn, like, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. People thought he might be Shao Kahn or related, and then he wasn't. And then, And then, yeah, people didn't like him. My favorite appearance of him was Deadly Alliance. <laughs> <laughs> Best fatality as well. <laughs> From all of his I fatality. I like when he was around. I like Out of all of his fatality, <laughs> my favorite is his fatality. Yep. I, I like the fatality where the guy crawls away. But yeah, all right, let's talk. But we should actually talk about Fujin. Fujin, yeah. right. Well, we just we just covered him real quick. We got Suhao out of the way. <laughs> it's a twofer. No longer eligible. No, I can actually talk about Suhao no, in a future episode. I'm probably the only one, but I'll do it. No, I, I, I'm looking forward to it. That's more of a threat than anything. Oh, God. <laughs> I can talk about Suhao for at least a good ten minutes and try to keep my negativity to a bare minimum. Ugh. We'll see about the potential I think that he could have. I've warmed up to him over the years. All right, well, I'll yeah, start. Uh, I'll start Fujin. Fujin off because it's basically just going to rewrapping up what I've already said. I feel like um, I hope he takes Raiden's place based on Raiden's actions and and our MK Nine. Um, but actual retrospective stuff, I thought Fujin was a cool character in MK Four. Um, I hope to see the crossbow back because that was pretty cool. And I like the way his outfit works, and I like his storyline. It's a shame that it, that just kind of fell by the wayside, unfortunately. But I definitely hope to see that played up here in MKX. I hope he's in MKX. And my favorite fatality of his was him lifting up his opponent with like a little tornado and then blasting him with the uh, the crossbow. And that's that. That's Fujin for me. I really yeah don't have much yeah, more we, to say. We talked about him. <laughs> A lot. So yeah. I mean, just real quick, I I wish he would replace Raiden for real and get to you know be in games where he actually acts as the protector of Earthrealm. I love the crossbow. I hate his hair in Armageddon. I like him better with the really tight ponytail. Right. Uh, and that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Fujin. I'm gonna go straight to the questions you guys have had up here. Uh, I guess the really really big one is the fact that. What will his interactions with Raiden be like? Should he maybe even replace him? The answer is yes. Yes, he really should. And I can't stress that often enough. It's 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 the single biggest topic that, that, that comes up whenever Fujin is brought up. You know, he's a character that's that doesn't have much or any in the way of detractors. And 
and he, he's always been paid as that that natural successor to Raiden once Raiden ascends to full Elder Godhood. And in a situation, to recap what we said prior, like this, where Raiden's plainly done a shit job of being who he is and being protector of Earth Rome, and everyone knows it, yes, the Elder Gods really need to send Fujin over with a fucking pink slip to say, you're no longer qualified or fit to be doing what you're doing. I have to step in and take charge. I'm not going to like it, but this is my job. You know, he works for the Elder Gods. They all work for the Elder Gods. And Raiden probably wouldn't even take it personally. He'd probably still fight for it, but he'd get why Fujin was doing it. Yeah, I thought Raiden probably feels bad, and he'd be all like, you know, you're probably right. <laughs> At least I'd he'd like to step, hope he does. He'd step down if he has any sense left in him. Uh, should he take inspiration from airbenders like I'm from the last airbender and tends to the legend of Korra, this one from Kung Lao doesn't suck, that's actually not a bad idea. I kind of like... I, I was a pretty big fan of uh, the original Avatar series, and not that I can particularly name a lot of things that Aang specifically did during that series, but, you know, the notion of him riding in on a ball of wind, that'd be a nice little nod to him, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's the one that comes to mind most for me, too. Where it, re- just... it really does. It's, it's kind of synonymous with the series. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do with wind power, you know? not just It's not just about, like, shoving the guy back or pulling him forward or lifting him up into midair slightly. You know, you could you could suspend him, you can keep him in place, you can break some limbs. There is a lot that you can do with wind. It's very versatile. Anyone else remember anything that I did on, on Last Airbender? No, I never watched I, you it. Know, never saw it. I I love the show and I really like Korra too. Um not as much, but still a good show. But yeah, I mean it's just the airbenders do so many different things. I mean, it's just a matter of, here's some wind, be creative. You, I wouldn't point to any specific move. I'd just say, don't, you know, make him Kung Lao plus Ermac, and it's that simple. That's fair enough to me. It was always a really, really unfair criticism of Fujin that that's basically what people saw him as. It's not without reason. I think that he does need to ditch the aerial diet because that's kind of a Kung Lao trademark and just focus more on different types of things you could do in the air. Like we mentioned last time, uh, the guy should totally have a specific variation that's devoted just to staying up in the air and you know, coming at you from every possible angle. No reason yeah, to restrict yeah, just should, one single fly. line. He should fly a lot yeah. better than Sindel does. Absolutely. It should be honestly like fucking controlling some sort of Marvel vs. Capcom character that won't freaking come down. Maybe have it as a trade-off, have him take more damage than your average character. You know? Hey, Randy E., thanks for subscribing to us on YouTube just now. <laughs> <laughs> if he hears right, this episode. On the air. <laughs> if he hears that's this episode. That's a hint episode, to everybody else. It's going to be, feel so weird. <laughs> but, Ujin uh, should have a power. I just got an email up. that he subscribes, so that's funny. Ujin should lift you up with his wind and force you to subscribe to our channel. All right, Temp, you got any uh, Fujin uh, thoughts to uh, for our retrospective? <laughs> I'm pretty much in the same situation. I've said most of what I wanted to say. Uh, just to be specific, he's probably my third favorite character. I, I like Fujin a lot. I miss Fujin. And other than Shinnok and Sector, pretty much every character that was kind of shoved into Armageddon I, I mean, it, it, it's it's not even like a badge of honor. It, it's almost an insult. So I want to undo that. I, I want to fix Fujin. I want to bring him back and really kind of, you know, and initiate him back into the lore. Because, I mean, granted, his contribution to MK4 was important, but you would never know it by playing the later games. So that's where we're at. We need to basically bring Fujin back into the light. And I like the hair, actually. I like his hair better in Armageddon. I love those sexy braids. <laughs> the conditioner. Eh, the braid is alright, I just didn't like the loose bangs. It made him look too much like other characters. Yeah, I can see that. I would also bring the dive kick back. I, I think we need a lot of dive kicks in Mortal Kombat. Like, yeah, yeah not bunch. enough characters have a dive kick. I'll agree with that. And Kung Lao's dive kick, dive kick it's, it's used for two things. It's used for space, it's used for shutting down footsies, and it's used for checking the other character. Uh, kind of like a telepunch, you know? You don't do a telepunch because it does damage. You do it because 
you're trying to scare the opponent into blocking and not doing anything. But if Fujin got, like, pressure off his attack, that would be really cool if he got, like, a... You know, if he had to chain it into a combo instead of, like... Well, no, Sonya could do that, I guess. But Sonya had a fully punishable dive kick. I wouldn't want Fujin to have that. So- Sonya's dive kick had a weird arc to it. Yeah, it was really... St- and it was hard to punish for certain characters, too. I would like to see a more traditional dive kick for Fujin. Like, another and... another thought as far as moves is, I'd like to see him be a guy who, like... Like, Sadira in Killer Instinct has this unique position on the roster because she's all about air combos. I'd like to see Fujin do that. Yeah, that would be sick, you know? And, um, I mean, it, it's, the sky's the limit because he doesn't have to be a zoner. He doesn't have to be a ranged character. He he can find sort of this middle ground and have all these options, but he's kind of a jack-of-all-trades, you know? And I don't know. I really want to see Fujin again. And if he's not in this game, we it's funny because we don't have much to talk about now, but if he doesn't show up, especially like as DLC... If he's still not nowhere to be seen, I'm going to have a lot to say. Like, I'm going to have a fuck ton to say about Fujin at that point. I, I, I don't know if we'll get to that point, though. I I have no reason to believe he's not in the game. But, um... It, yeah, all we really have is maybe the inkling that they don't think he's a cool character because they didn't bring him back until Armageddon. Yeah. Right. To which we say, it couldn't be more wrong. It's a character in which we see nothing but potential and cool factor. Yeah, I don't know what Fujin fans... World, but yeah. I don't know how the Fujin fans get along. I really don't. <laughs> Those people it are as loud as they can be, and it's not working yet. At least not yet. I mean... Uh, no, I people know. have been talking about and asking for Fujin since he wasn't in Deadly Alliance or Deception, so... You know what? I feel like, I feel like Fujin might be this game's reign. If he doesn't actually come in... Like, as part of the initial roster, yeah, I can totally see him be DLC. Just for, like, fan outcry purposes. I think I that if, if Tanya is left off the roster, she'll probably steal Fujin's spot in DLC. And that kind of bums me out. I hope that's not the case. I feel like he shouldn't be DLC. I feel like he's somebody that would benefit from, you know, having some story Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. Main, main I just think that if, if they did time. leave him off... And I think it's likely that they'll leave Tanya off because Edenia doesn't exist anymore and isn't really important anymore. And that was kind of her whole reason to be, was it subplots involving Edenia. So I think like if we don't see Tanya and we don't see Fujin, and it comes down to one or the other in like votes on Twitter, Tanya will definitely win just because you know, that's what I see people talk about more. But I, I definitely think Fujin should be on the main roster because he's story important. Yeah. All right, Temp, uh, favorite fatality for Fujin? Uh, MK4, crossbow, shoot you out of the air, you explode. Creates a little whirlwind. Easy. And uh, favorite costume? Well, like I said, Armageddon. I I just think it looks sleek. I love the colors and everything. All right, well, that'll wrap it up for Fujin. Sorry if that... One more question. Whoa. (laughs) Wow, (laughs) okay. (laughs) Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm sorry. I hate to do this to you, but uh, who's the host here? <laughs> uh, that does it for uh, Fujin. <laughs> um, well, shit. <laughs> All right, well, that'll wrap it up. No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. And... <laughs> <laughs> All right, smoke and see. Um, would we prefer it if, if Fujin had an arrow he can manipulate, kind of like Yandu from Guardians of the Galaxy, as opposed to uh, a crossbow? I'm going to say no. I love the crossbow. I don't really want to see him shoot arrows as much as I want to see him use it for melee and kind of incorporate the arrows in there, but I always like how Hawkeye used his bow in Marvel vs. Capcom. I like how Green Arrow used his bow in Injustice. I want to see Fujin do something, ser- you know, very similar, you know. Maybe, yeah. like, throw the crossbow at you and bring it back like a boomerang. I love crossbows. Remember, <laughs> he's, he is a wind god, and there's very little that he shouldn't be able to do on command with such a lightweight instrument, you know? Yeah. They just think attached like, I mean, fire them off. Perhaps his EX moves are variations of it. We can actually control the projectile for a small bit after it actually leaves the bow. So, I mean, yeah, he should I, be able to. I mean, if he controls the wind, you should be able to shoot an arrow and quickly be able to, you know, do a gush of wind that sends it in a different direction. I mean, why not? Yeah. Yeah, and and we just, talked about that, like, how a projectile weapon is perfect for a wind guy, and that's why... 
he should never have had that that tree branch they almost gave him an Armageddon that you know people talk about well if he's going to have a weapon he should have had it no crossbow man projectiles <laughs> yeah. wind god think about it <laughs> can I also posit that if he actually does show up again a really really nice visual effect to give the guy would be to have a slight wind effect visible all around him like radiating out and away from the guy like actually seeing your opponent's trench or whatever blow back a little bit just by being close proximity to that. That'd be really sweet to see. Yeah, if there was like swirls of like you know, like white streaks or whatever or like leaves and stuff fluttering around him, however you want to display wind, that would definitely fit because I mean Raiden has the lightning all around his body. Like all the gods should have some kind of effect like that. Alright, well uh that'll wrap it up for this episode. And uh, the Fujin talk, of course. But if you want to hear more about Fujin, you can go to episode two, where we, I think we covered him like 40 minutes. We went really in detail about him and MKX and what we want to see and all of that stuff. So, I mean, a lot of those questions we already answered. We just talked about him a little bit here as well. But yes, if you want more detail, feel free to, you know, just because you listened to it once before doesn't mean you can't listen to it again if you still want to hear us talk about Fujin. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's always there. That's that's the neat thing about the there internet. There was an episode two. I think it was episode Our three, actually. Our voices just get sexier but yes, every time you listen to us. It was episode three, I believe, that we did the top ten we want to see in MKX. And yes, we went very in detail about Fujin. Um, so yeah, so if you're, if you're digging the Fujin talk, I'd go listen to that if you haven't already. And hopefully we'll be able to talk more about Fujin in the future when he's officially revealed. And we'll give him plenty of talk then. So hopefully nobody was disappointed by this, but we just really feel like everything has been said that can be said other than if he's revealed for the actual game. But beyond that, that'll do it for this episode. Once again, you can subscribe to us on YouTube on our channel or MKO's channel, but we prefer you do both, or at least ours, because we love ours, because it is you, ours. You will, get, you will get the episodes sooner if you subscribe to ours. It's true. MKO has a little bit of a lag time just because you got to listen to the episode and go through it and right up to show notes, etc. But yeah, ours goes up usually around Thursday nights, usually when I get done editing or whatever. But uh, yeah, and you can also go on iTunes. And if you want to help out the podcast, I don't feel like I mentioned this yet, but should be stressed. If you want to help us out, the best way, other than you know coming on the show and sharing your own opinions and responding in the thread, of course, and submitting questions, is to tell friends. Tell your friends. Go to other forums and post it. You know, that that's the best way is word of mouth. I don't advertise. We don't advertise. I, I talk to, you know, administrators of forums and hopefully they'll, you know, post it or if they're digging it, they'll, you know, get behind it. But other than that, you know, we don't really do much for it. So if you guys like it, definitely share it with other people. Go to Facebook groups. There's so many Mortal Kombat Facebook groups that it's ridiculous. Go and post them on there. That'd be great. But uh, other than that, yeah, keep sending in questions. Um. I actually do have one thing to say about questions. When you submit questions for each episode, you don't have to necessarily send them about the the character at hand, like the one we're doing the retrospective on. Feel free to send in questions about anything relating to MK or just anything in general. If it's a funny question that doesn't even relate to MK, I'd love to ask it and have us discuss it, or even if it's just something silly that you just want me to have to say or tempt to say. It'll be hilarious. It's good entertainment, then you can send it in. By all means, you don't have to... Send in, what does this character, what are your thoughts on this character being an MKX? Just send us absolutely anything relating to absolutely anything you want, and we'll ask it and talk about it in whatever amount of detail that we can manage to pull out of it. But yes, I just we're loving the feedback and the participation on your end, so keep that up and take it to even you know new heights. But uh, with that said, um, I think that does it for this episode. So I hope everybody has a great week. Nobody needs to go fuck themselves this week. So I mean, unless you want to, I mean that's cool. I don't want. That's a matter of opinion. Anything can. To, I don't want to take it off the table. Still probably will. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, anything else to do tonight? So uh, yeah, I, li- I like to you know keep options open. But uh, yeah, I hope everybody takes care and have a good week. And uh, we'll see you next week for episode nine, uh, for our the rest of our top ten, the top five, and uh, hopefully we'll have some news to discuss as well on top of that. But for everyone else and myself, this uh, that's an episode, so see you guys later. Toodaloo. Enjoy watching Faces of Death. <laughs> don't, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs>
that. that no, don't. Game. I agree. Please don't do 4. that. 4.5 stars out of 5, folks. I'm responsible <laughs> for any <that> <laughs> What are you waiting for?